Koreta is without specs. Koreta use lenses. Ah, yeah, she is without specs. Kank, I think uh, we are yeah, now we live start. on YouTube. Yes. And you can yes, start. Yes. You can start. Please. Yes, please. Yes, please. You can invite. Good evening, me. everyone. Respected all faculties. First of all. by respected call sir respected avtar singh sir respected webinar patrons dr david balotra sir and dr sp sharma sir with your permission may i start with the proceedings sir it yes. would okay. success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome taking a clue out of this quote our society rssacp has achieved this feat under the avid leadership of our respected patrons dr avtar singh sir and dr tej ke call sir and webinar patrons dr sp sharma sir the current president and the very well the ever dynamic dr david balotra sir the respected secretary of the society that is rssacp it is a great achievement for our society that we have completed a complete webinar series last year and in this particular new year this is the first series of our webinar Happy Lodi and Happy Makkah Sankranti. May this new year bring all the happiness and joy to each and every one. We are we have passed through very difficult times and hope the coming of vaccine will just a little bit bring a hope of revival into our lives. And and now I will request and I'll pass the baton to our respected president, Dr. S. P. Sharma sir, and our respected secretary, Dr. Navin Balotra sir, to say a few words about our webinar. SP sir bas sir please very good evening or respected patron dr call sir past presidents all office bearers all participants first of all i say happy new year i welcome you all in this first webinar of this year which is a part of academic webinar series 2021 of rscb in this new year we have got new hopes new resolutions more expectation for growth of our society i believe that rscp will achieve further heights and it will increase its presence internationally by efforts of we all our vision and goal are very clear we are determined to increase our academic programs by conducting more cmes conferences to educate to update to keep pace with the developments to help the medical fraternity and for the mankind today one of the important occasion is lori and i wish you a very happy lori this harvest season to bring happiness prosperity and success to we all today's webinar is on the super specialty of anesthesia that is neuroanesthesia and critical care in fact the neuroanesthesia specialty has progressed well and truly speaking the budding anesthesiologist are choosing this specialty by choice today's topics are excellent besides the other topics traumatic brain injury have got more attention the whole world wide so this for this also in this webinar you will be updated or your knowledge i welcome our all esteemed speakers dr vanitha rajgopalan assistant professor in neuroanesthesia department aims new delhi dr simika makkar senior consultant and chief medical services columbia asia hospital in patiala dr vinod gagdani consultant in the medanta hospital gurgaon and dr varita srivastava consultant in chl hospital indore i also welcome our esteemed chairpersons who have kindly given the acceptance to chair the session they will make the session interactive and useful society express deep gratitude to speakers chairpersons for sparing time to share their expression and to share their experience i also welcome our all participants who have enthusiasm in academic activities they will definitely update and refresh their knowledge about the new anesthesia and critical care i congratulate dr mayank masan senior consultant in medanta hospital indore for organizing this webinar 
Dr. Mayank is always very active in the, for the academic activities. I appreciate him for his work. My sincere thanks to all and especially to Dr. Ravin Malhotra for clear vision for shape, shaping the academic activities of RACP. With regards, long live RACP. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for uh, kind words. Greetings from Research Society of Anesthesiology Clinical Pharmacology Secretariat and National Headquarters. Wish you all a very happy Lodi today and happy Bhogi. And also uh, in advance, greetings for Makar Sakranti tomorrow and Pongal festivals over the next three to four days. Respected Dr. Tej K. Kaul, sir, patron RSSVP. President Dr. S.P. Sharma, sir, and the organizing chairperson of today's program, my dear Dr. Mayank Masan. Today is a very auspicious day that we are kick-starting the academic programs of the year and of the decade. We have entered uh, a new month, new year, and a new decade. And uh, uh, Dr. Mayank is lucky enough to hold the first ever academic yeah. webinar series of Research Society of Anesthesiology Clinical Pharmacology of January 2021. No webinar is successful without the active contribution of the speakers as well as the chairpersons. So organizing committee does one part and I'm really thankful to all the speakers and the chairpersons who will be deliberating today. And I'm very sure it will be quite enlightening and enriching for all the delegates who are attending this uh, webinar on neuroanesthesia and critical care. Uh, I extend best wishes to all the speakers and the chairpersons and also uh, invite you all to the forthcoming first international conference of Research Society of Anesthesiology Clinical Pharmacology and 30th National Conference of RSSAP to be conducted virtually on 6th and 7th March 2021. Thank you very much. Be safe and keep yourself healthy and your family healthy. Long live RSSAP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President Sir, Dr. S.P. Sharma Sir and Secretary Sir, Dr. Dabir Balhotra Sir. Uh, sir, with your permission, may I proceed? Please. Thank you so much, Sir. Sir, the first topic of today's meet is about the neuro monitoring part. Neuro anesthesia and critical care is a field which is incomplete without monitoring. Over the past few decades, the monitoring has definitely increased the safety of anesthesia, but vigilance is must. It was very kind of you, S.P. Sharma sir and Manotra sir to give such kind words about me as well as long live RSACP. Now, the, for the first topic, the speaker is Dr. Vanita Rajagopalan, Madam, and the chairpersons are our respected Dr. Sadha Sarvasarkar, Madam, and respected Dr. Veshali Vaidhanikar, Madam. Dr. Sadha Sarvasarkar, Madam, is a consultant anesthesiologist and an ex-professor and head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at C. Orbindo Institute of Medical Sciences, Indore. Her area of interest are into pediatric anesthesia, critical care management. She is a life member of Indian Society of Anesthesiology, RSACP, as well as Indian Society of Pain. She has been the Scientific Organizing Chairman of MP ISACON 2019 and Organizing Chairman of EORA 2016. Warm welcome to the board, madam. Thank you. And Thank the you second so chairperson you. for this particular topic is Dr. Vaishali Vaidenekar, madam. She is the head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal. Her speciality experience is of cardiac anesthesia, plastic, neuroanesthesia, pediatric, USG guided nerve blocks, dental anesthesia, liver analgesia. She has chaired several scientific sessions, both at the national as well as state level. She has got 35 original research projects published, accepted for publication in many reputed national as well as international journals. She has presented extreme number of case reports and review articles. We welcome you on board, Dr. Veshali, madam. Please, uh, please welcome on board Dr. Veshali and Dr. Sadda. I would now request the chairpersons to please introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. 
Uh, let me take the privilege to introduce Dr. Vanita Rajagopalan. She is a qualified neuroanesthesiologist, presently working as All in at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Her area of interest are neurocritical care, neuromonitoring, pain management, pediatric neuroanesthesiology, and neurotrauma. She is a reviewer in various journals of anesthesiology as well as neuroanesthesia. And she is the right person to speak on today's first topic, that is clinical aspects of neuromonitoring. Over to Dr. Vanita, please. Dr. Vanita? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, madam, for the kind introduction. Uh, monitoring in most ICUs between the 1960s and 1980s was restricted to clinical examination, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, body temperature, and the central venous pressure monitoring. With the advent of the pulmonary artery catheter, monitoring of cardiac output and right-sided filling pressures became possible, providing new understanding and acting as a guide to therapy for the resuscitation of cardiogenic and septic shock. Neurological ICUs at that time focused almost exclusively on the care of post-operative neurosurgical patients, and neuromonitoring was basically restricted to serial neurological examination and in some units to intracranial pressure monitoring. These neurochecks often did not reveal changes in cerebral function until they were irreversible. So this gave rise to the idea to detect clinical deterioration as soon as possible enabling prompt efforts to reverse or correct any injurious process. This era was known as the age of the clinical neuromonitoring. From then, we have progressed to an age of multimodality monitoring and neurophysiological decision support, though this is still at its infancy. What we currently follow is the reactive treatment model. And what is required is a shift to the proactive treatment model. So simultaneous monitoring of brain oxygen tension, brain temperature, ICP, cerebral perfusion pressure, cerebral blood flow, and cerebral metabolism, in addition to TCD ultrasonography, continuous EEG monitoring, and cardiovascular parameters, offers the potential to impact neurologic outcome by enabling detection of early changes in the brain physiology, and thus the shifting from, of the treatment from a reactive model to a proactive model. So the various multimodal neuromonitoring which we have today include the clinical neurological evaluation, the cerebral flow directed techniques, which include the intracranial pressure monitoring, the cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring, the transcranial Doppler, the laser Doppler flowmetry, and the thermal diffusion flowmetry. The others are the cerebral autoregulation monitors, the cerebral oxygenation directed techniques, which include the jugular venous oximetry, the brain tissue oximetry, the non-invasive near-infrared spectroscopy, the metabol the, those reflecting cerebral metabolism, which include microdialysis and imaging techniques, those reflecting the global cerebral function, like the electroencephalogram and quantitative EEG, and then the damage markers, which include S100 beta and neuro neuron-specific enolase. Clinical evaluation definitely forms the main a part of neuromonitoring. Initially, the Glasgow Coma Scale, and even now, it, for the, almost the last four decades, this is being the one which is commonly used for clinical assessment of the neural of any brain injured patient. The four, that is the full outline of unresponsiveness score, and various other newer uh, scoring systems have also evolved, but they have not developed wild clinical acceptance. The, to make the pupillary examination more objective, we now have the infrared pupillometry. The cerebral blood flow directed techniques include ICP monitoring, which can be both invasive as well as non-invasive. The invasive ICP monitoring techniques are the external ventricular catheters or the Camino or Cordman catheters, which can be placed either ventricularly or in the in, um, intraparenchymally. Then they also include the subdural or the epidural probes and the Richmond system. Now, for uh, the insertion of these uh, 
catheters, ICP catheters, the point select, uh, selected is the same as for the uh, external ventricular drain placement, that is which is known as the caucus point. And it is usually two centimeters lateral to the midline and two centimeters anterior to the coronal suture in the mid pupillary line. Now, this is a, a, a major article published in the in any JM in 2012, which says that for patients with severe traumatic brain injury, ICP monitoring has not been superior to imaging and clinical examination. However, a word of caution that these results must be interpreted with extreme caution as there is a high risk of negative false negative error and a move away would be detrimental because waveform analysis of the ICP is also important. The non-invasive methods to monitor the ICP include the optic nerve sheath diameter. And it has been seen that the optic nerve sheath diameter is a strong predictive factor for increased ICP. Now, this uh, op, uh, ultrasound optic nerve, ultrasound guided optic nerve sheath diameter is assessed usually three centimeter behind the globe, and a value cutoff value of five, uh, three millimeter, sorry, and a cutoff value of five millimeter is taken as normal. Beyond five millimeter, it is considered to be raised ICP. Now, the recent advances in ICP monitoring is a threshold of 22 millimeters of mercury is taken and beyond 22 millimeters of mercury, it warrants treatment of the intracranial pressure. This there is a evolving concept of the overall burden or the dose of ICP, which is the duration, the total duration and the total severity of the rise in ICP, which has to be taken for treatment. The optimal positioning of these monitoring devices in focal lesions. And then there is an emphasis on waveform analysis. Now, the accurate location of these monitoring devices for cerebral perfusion, I mean, ICP is also give an idea about the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. Now, the zero reference point should be the same for both the arterial blood pressure as well as the ICP, which is usually taken as the level of the foramen of Munro and the external level is the, at the level of the trachus. This is important because if we have transduce our arterial blood pressure at the level of the heart, which we normally do, then that would that would lead to a difference of cerebral perfusion pressure of 11 millimeters of mercury between the actual cerebral perfusion pressure and the calculated cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, the next monitor that we have is the uh, pressure reactivity index. Now, pressure reactivity index like here, this uh, graph shows a patient. This is a clinical scenario where a patient on day four of admission starts developing a rise, starts developing refractory intracranial hypertension, and he eventually dies day on day five of admission. Here in this graph, we can see that prior to this A, that is or till day four, the patient has been having. ICP, which is like below 20 millimeters of mercury, and the pressure reactivity index is almost around zero. At this point, there is a gradual, the ICP gradually starts increasing, and within and with corresponding increase in the pressure reactivity index. And beyond this point B, there is a sustained increase in the intracranial pressure with a sustained increase in the pressure reactivity index. So what we see is that the pressure reactivity index has a co correlation coefficient, which ranges from minus one to plus one. And the normal value, that is, if it is cl closer to minus one, that is where the intracranial pressure and the uh, blood pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure are inversely related, then it is said to be a uh, good pressure reactivity coefficient or the patient will have a good clinical outcome. The closer it is to the positive one, then the it is like the correlation is almost same. And so the patient will have a worse clinical outcome. Now, then comes the concept of an optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, identifying the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure helps us to individualize the therapy towards every patient. Now, when we plot the cerebral perfusion pressure along the x-axis and the pressure reactivity index along the y-axis, we will get a U-shaped curve. Now, the lowest point or the maximum negative point of this U-shaped curve will determine the 
optimal cerebral perfusion pressure for an individual patient, which will help in individualizing the therapy for the patient. Now, when we see the cere optimal cerebral perfusion pressure and outcome, it is seen that uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained plus or minus within plus or minus five millimeters of mercury of optimal cerebral perfusion pressure to achieve a good neurological outcome. If it is beyond the plus five, then that indicates that is associated with severe disability at six months. And if it is less than the minus five value, I'm sorry for this, then it is associated with higher mortality. Now coming to the other cerebral blood flow monitoring techniques, these include the transcranial Doppler and the laser Doppler flow metry. These are based on the cerebral blood flow velocity and indirectly give us an idea about the cerebral blood flow and ICP and also about the perfusion pressure. The other monitoring modalities are the CT and the MR perfusion, which are qualitative, and the PET and SPECT and Xenon CT, which are quantitative. However, these cannot be performed. These cannot give us an idea of about the continuous cerebral blood flow and cannot be routinely monitored in the neurosurgical ICU. The transcranial color-coded Doppler ultrasonography is another method to monitor the cerebral blood flow. Thermal diffusion is also an, an upcoming method for monitoring the cerebral blood flow. Now, the cerebral oxygenation-directed techniques. Now, these can be broadly divided into the invasive techniques, which include the jugular venous oxygen saturation and the brain tissue oxygenation tension, and the non-invasive methods, which include near-infrared spectroscopy, the PET and the MR spectroscopy. Now, jugular venous oxygen saturation is a technique which can be used to estimate the balance between the global cerebral oxygen delivery and utilization. The normal value is between 55 to 75%, and this shows a perfect balance between the cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolic demand. Now, if it is less than 50%, it, includes, it indicates that the cerebral blood flow is decreased compared to the metabolic demand of the tissue. And if it is more than 80%, it indicates that there is an increased cerebral blood flow compared to the metabolic uh, demand. However, I mean, other than cerebral hyperemia, even when there is a decrease in the metabolism, the cerebral blood flow can be high. And so this can also be an indication for brain death. So always a high cerebral SGVO2 values need not indicate a, uh, I mean, a good outcome. So the importance level th there is level three evidence in brain according to brain trauma foundation for the importance of estimation of arteriovenous oxygen content difference and a multiple or sustained desaturation of more than 10 minutes is associated with poor outcome now coming to brain tissue oxygen determination it is uh, it tells us about it is a highly focal measurement and global changes can be missed the drawbacks associated with PBTO2 monitoring include the fact that it is a focal measure and in, may be influenced by the probe position. So placement of the probe is an invasive procedure. We have to allow some time for the probe to show valid values. Almost one to two hours after the placement of the probe is required to uh, before we can start taking the values. And then the position of the probe and whether the probe is working can be checked by increasing the percentage of oxygen which we deliver. And if there is a simultaneous increasing, increase in the PVTO2 values, then it indicates that the uh, probe is working. Once these are checked, the temperature adjustment has to be made. And the uh, Brain Trauma Foundation suggests that the P brain tissue oxygenation level should be maintained above 20 millimeters of mercury. And uh, as I've already told, the cerebral blood flow and the arterial partial pressure of oxygen can influence the PBTO2 values. The uh, PBTO2 values less than 10 millimeters of mercury is associated with very poor outcome in traumatic brain injury. So uh, this study showed that PBTO2 did not provide a survival or functional status improvement at discharge. However, this BOOST 2 trial, which was published in November 2017, shows that ICP in addition to, and I mean PBTO2 in addition to ICP shows a trend towards improved outcome with less mortality and more favorable outcomes. Coming to the non-invasive methods of brain oxygenation monitoring, first we have the near infrared spectroscopy. This is a non-invasive technique based on the transmission and absorption of near infrared light that is between 700 to 1000 nanometers as it passes through the tissue. 
Now, the main advantage of this technique is it is non-invasive method of estimating regional changes in cellular oxygenation. However, the clinical use is limited by its inability to differentiate between intracranial and extracranial changes in blood flow and oxygenation, which adversely affect, affects the reliability of the readings. Furthermore, the validation of this technique in neurointensive care units still requires further studies. Now, this article shows that there is no data to support that NIRS has many potential advantages over other neuromonitoring techniques, but further investigation and technological advances may be required. So we have the non-invasive, it is a non-invasive estimation of continuous cerebral blood flow. Ultrasound tagged NIRS can be a development which can be used for continuous cerebral blood flow monitoring. NIRS-based handheld devices to screen intracranial hematomas are also being used in the pre-hospital settings. Now, the monitors which reflect cerebral metabolism. So coming to this, microdialysis is the uh, most important monitor of cerebral metabolism. It works on the principle of osmosis that drives the passage of molecules across the membrane along their concentration gradient. So molecules with high concentration in the brain extracellular fluid pass into the perfusate with min, uh, pass into the perfusate and are removed at a constant rate and the concentration gradient is maintained now what we see is this is uh, i mean a perfusate which is infused through the catheter and this these are the molecules are present in the ecf of the brain now based on the concentration gra gradient the molecules move into the perfusate and then this is withdrawn and analyzed. Now, this is the thing. Lots of uh, parameters can be mon um, measured through this, like the lactate pyruvate ratio, the lactate glucose ratio, the uh, glucose, the pyruvate, etc. So now, whether this can be used as a routine application, and this is like uh, must be used. It's not for an isolated monitoring. It can be used in conjunction with other methods to provide true multimodality monitoring in critically ill patients. Now, there is a concept of hyperglycosis and neuroglycopenia after traumatic brain injury. This is an important concept because even with normal blood sugars being maintained after traumatic brain injury, there has been seen, I mean, uh, cerebral hypoglycemia or neuroglycopenia has been seen. And by increasing the uh, blood glucose levels, this has been seen to uh, normalize. Therefore, this concept is upcoming now in the management of traumatic brain injury. This also helps to differentiate ischemic from non-ischemic etiology. Like uh, ischemia is not the only reason for the lactate to go up. Even a mitochondrial failure that can occur because of decreased, I mean, because of seizure or any in excitotoxic injury that can also cause uh, increase in lactate pyruvate ratio. So it is also useful in neuroprotective drug trials because uh, large molecules can be assessed and then the there is the sampling is rapidly available with cerebral uh, microdialysis. Now portable CT scanners are another um, method to assess the metabolism cerebral metabolism like we have bedside ct in our icus it allows a rapid scan time flexible settings and immediate image viewing and helps in real time imaging immediate neuromonitoring even in the smallest of medical centers so this is how we have like we perform the bedside ct in our icus then those monitors which reflect global cerebral function like which is the electroencephalogram. It is a dynamic brain function monitoring and it's a new concept in neurointensive care. Continuous electroencephalographic monitoring has gained uh, importance recently because of the development of non-convulsive seizures or non-convulsive status epilepticus. It is seen in almost 40% of patients with neurological injury where they do not have any manif external manifestations of seizures, but there is uh, seizure activity noted on the EEG, and this occurs despite adequate serum levels of the anti-epileptic medications. Now, this is uh, a continuous. This picture shows a continuous EEG and somatosensory evoked potential monitoring in our ICU. A is a small amplification device. 
and this is connected to a pc by means of an optical fiber now this is the straight stainless steel needle electrodes which are gathered in plates of colored strings and the needles are covered with a transparent plastic dressing and this is a plug in device to connect the patient to the monitor so continuous eeg should be monitored for at least 48 hours to detect non convulsive status epilepticus now the quantitative eeg is another method which is developing uh, which is become upcoming an invasive eeg is more specific as compared to the scalp electroencephalogram now once the monitoring parameters are obtained there is a common danger of either discounting or misinterpreting the obtained values so uh, it, it takes expertise and diligence to understand the role of an abnormal monitoring result so this is a mobile system which can be moved to the bedside and attached to various monitoring devices the built in software may provide advanced analysis for real time decision support disadvantage of these systems are the cost involved and usually only one patient can be monitored at a time and data are not acquired unless the device is manually connected to the patient so this is a real time multimodal monitoring of the physiological parameters in a patient now this is an array which can be customized to provide important information all at a glance in this array what we can see is the working list of the patient the brain imaging the lung imaging the laboratory values the eeg and the cerebral microdialysis values along with the vital parameters and this cockpit array permits the physician to integrate and compare data that are time logged and to begin to integrate the data to the best plan and the next step of therapy this is a summary of all that we have discussed so far this is a representative figure showing the location of the multimodality neuromonitoring probes using a double or a triple human cranial bolt multiple pro probes can be fixed to the skull like this is a double human probe through which multiple neuromonitoring devices can be connected to the patient and uh, because the majority of these probes are radio they can be visualized during the scout film of a ct this is the ap and the lateral view of the same so multimodality monitoring gathers a variety of information which includes the intracranial pressure the cerebral blood flow the blood, brain tissue meta, uh, brain tissue oxygenation the brain tissue metabolism and electric status of the brain all of which allow for a better understanding of any physiological changes in the brain so multimodality monitoring undoubtedly enhances the accuracy of interpretation of events and may help in targeting treatment more appropriately and an experience in these techniques grow it will become apparent which of these modalities are required to provide the most accurate reflection of intracranial events and monitor subsequent therapy so the neurocritical care society and the european society of intensive care medicine have given this consensus statement or regarding multimodality monitoring based on the available literature now multimodality monitoring is not free from complications these are the physical complications that can arise due to the devices the other disadvantages of multimodality monitoring include the cost the high labor intensive it is a highly labor intensive method and may require a trained technician or a highly trained nursing staff to gather data and uh, when the data has to be downloaded from the monitor onto a computer then this will increase the cost by require by the requirement of a additional software so now to the important next step is to understand how we can move beyond observational studies and conduct more prospective randomized control trials to say whether which of these multimodality monitorings or how in combination they can help in improving the outcome of the patient thank you and uh, wish wish everybody a very happy harvest festival thank you dr vanita it was wonderful and too easy to uh, it was a difficult topic because the latest monitors which have come to monitor the neuroanesthesia part or a patient with neuro neuro going undergoing neuro surgery really made very easy to understand congratulations for that
and uh, questions can we take right now or will be taking at the end of the better we can take it right now the okay. questions will be there in the chat box okay <clears throat> There are no questions in the chat box. I right think now. no, no question in the chat box. Right. <laughs> so, so either everybody has understood it well, or nobody has understood it. <laughs> People are not interested in asking the questions. <laughs> Adam, if you have any questions, you can you can ask to Doctor Vadita. Doctor Doctor Vidod, if you have any questions, you can ask to Doctor Vadita. Okay. Okay then. Should we move Frankly on to speaking, another topic? All the monitors she's, which she has used, I have not even seen many many of them. Agreed. So Completely I agreed. have to go and see them first. Right? Cerebral microdialysis. What she has been doing. So I think there is no question. We can move ahead. Thank you, Doctor Vanita. Thank you. There is a question. There is a question. Okay. Specifically. Good evening, everybody. Well presented, Vadita. Excellent talk. Specifically, specifically for pediatric neurosurgery patient, which monitoring is useful? Ma'am, uh, I mean, all of these monitors can be used even in pediatric patients. The threshold values are different for them. That is what we have to see. Like uh, when it comes to op like non-invasively, if you are me measuring the ICP. Then uh, the op optic nerve sheath diameter is taken as four millimeters for infants and more than four point five millimeters in case of children and beyond <clears throat> five millimeters in adults. Whereas the other ICP values uh, th that that remains the same, like beyond twenty two. That is the brain trauma uh, foundation guidelines, which says that if it is sustained increase in the ICP for more than five minutes above twenty two millimeters of mercury, then we have to institute therapy. And the other thing is that is the perfusion pressure. The ideal thing to do now, like in adults, we say it's 60 to 70 as a broad term, like 60 to 70 should be the cerebral perfusion pressure, ideally. But the upcoming concept now is the to detect the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure for an individual patient and base our therapy on based on whatever is the optimum for that patient. This will reduce uh, the adverse uh, adverse side effects of uh, increasing perfusion pressure and will also improve the neurological outcome for the patient. So this will be more useful in pediatric patients if we can optimize their cerebral, I mean, uh, find the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure and then institute therapy accordingly. The other microdialysis parameters and all that remain the same. Thank you so much, Dr. Vadita, for an excellent talk. Thank you so much, both the chairpersons, Dr. Respected Sadha Sarvath Sarkar, Madam, and Respected Dr. Vaishali Vaidanekar, Madam. Uh, with your permission, Madam, can we move on to yeah, the please. next topic? Please, please, yeah, please, please. please. So, uh, we now move on to the next topic. The next topic is myasthenia gravis and aesthetic considerations. And the speaker for this particular topic is Dr. <coughs> Sivika Bakkar. Now, first of all, let me introduce you to the two chairpersons of this particular topic. The first chairperson for this particular topic is Dr. Lina Shibu. She has done a diploma in anesthesia from MJ Medical College in Don and DMB in anesthesiology from Maharashtra. She has got 16 years of anesthesia in various fields and 10 years of teaching experience. Presently, she is working in Maibar Medical College, Talegao, Pune. Her special interest is in research and she has done a vast amount of clinical research and academic writing. <coughs> Please welcome on board Dr. Lina Shibu from Talega. Dr. Lina, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Can you yeah. hear me, Mel? Uh, <coughs> along with her, there is Dr. Subodh Chaturvedi. His academic experiences and his clinical knowledge is immense. He has done his diploma in anesthesia from MGM Medical College in Dor. He is an experienced cardiac anesthesiologist with more than 14 years of experience in cardiac anesthesiology, as well as more than five years of experience in exclusive bariatric operations. He is involved in more than 100 cases of bariatric surgeries per month in the respected Mohawk Bariatric Institute of St. Orbindo Institute of Medical Sciences. Along with this, he has been involved in the CPCR formation guidelines at the national level, along with Dr. Chakra Rao, sir. Welcome on board, Dr. Subodh Chaturvedi. 
Now, please may I request both the chairpersons to introduce our respective speaker, Dr. Sibika Bakkar, for the talk. Yes, I'll take it first. Uh, it thank you, Mayank, uh, for inviting us on this uh, uh, board, and I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Sibika, my good friend, and she is. Can you hear me, Mayank? Yes, yeah, she is. But clear to everybody. Yeah, yes. Uh, she is MD, DNB, anesthesiology. She has more than 15 years of experience, and she is my batchmate. And she has worked as senior consultant in eminent institutes like AIMS, uh, New Delhi, PGI, MER, Chandigarh. Presently, she is working as a chief of medical services and senior consultant anesthesia, intensive care, and pain specialist at Columbia Asia Hospital, Patiala. She is also an ABH assessor. And I know she will be a very strict NABH assessor, <laughs> and she'll be presenting on my senior gravis and aesthetic implication. Over to you, Samika. May I request Dr. Subodh to say a few words also? Uh, first of all, I I feel actually lucky to have worked uh, worked with her. I have been her houseman, and uh, we used to idolize her. Ki uh, inke jaisa banna, inke jaisa anesthetics banna, inke jaisa padhna hai. Now I don't know वैसा बन पाए कि नहीं बन पाए but it is really I mean when Mayank sir so, uh, told कि Simika ma'am को introduce करना तो even that was a privilege so uh, ma'am आप दिख नहीं रहे हो आप दिख जाओ तो फिर आगे शुरू करें Over to you Dr. Simika Simika unmute yourself Dr. Sevika, are you there? Yeah, she is there, but she has not unmuted her. Okay, I will call her and tell her. Dr. Sevika, are you there? Yeah, there, Sevika. Uh, good evening, everybody. Am Am I audible? Yes, yes, Sevika, you are audible. okay thank you uh, first i'd like to thank uh, uh, dr leena and dr subodh uh, for such a kind introduction uh, a very good evening to all my respected seniors teachers and my dear friends wishing all a very happy lodi and a happy makar sankranti it's such an auspicious occasion and thank you all uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, today i will be speaking on the topic myasthenia gravis and aesthetic implications is my screen uh, visible yes yes amika so by definition as uh, by the national institute of neurological disorders and stroke it is defined as a chronic autoimmune neuromuscular disease which causes weakness in the skeletal muscles and that worsens after periods of activity and there is fatigue improves after periods of rest these muscles are basically responsible for functions involving breathing and moving parts of the body including arms and legs and it leads to varying degree of proximal uh, skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue affecting ocular bulbar and respiratory muscles uh, the incidence is 0.3 to 2.8 per, uh, per 1 lakh population more common in women with the uh, in the age group of 20 to 40 years and men mostly after 50 to 60 years Uh, by conti et al uh, most commonly it was due to anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies are mostly found in these patients and in some cases uh, where uh, it is uh, antibody negative even the anti musk antibodies are found in few cases genetic defects uh, at the neuromuscular junction are found rarely coming on to the pathophysiology uh, it is basically due to decrease in the number of post synaptic acetylcholine receptors uh, due to the anti uh, bodies which basically uh, reduce the activated post synaptic receptors and which uh, are insufficient to trigger a muscle action potential so with repeated stimulation there is a decline in release of acetylcholine which correlates the with the characteristic fatigability the most common presentation is fatigability of voluntary muscles uh initially most commonly presentation is with ptosis and diplopia when only the eyelids and the extraocular muscles are involved bulbar involvement results in facial muscles resulting in a nasal tone to speech flattening of the smile crease 
and gradually progressing to weakness of the proximal muscles, proximal limbs, and diaphragm. Uh, 85% of the myasthenic patients go on to develop generalized weakness also, and sometimes respiratory failure. There can also be coexistent autoimmune diseases like SLE, thyroid diseases, uh, diabetes, and other diseases. Clinical pattern, as I told, early in the course, lids and extraocular muscles uh, presenting as ptosis and diplopia. Facial weakness uh, resulting in difficulty in uh, chewing and snarling expression. Bulba weakness resulting in uh, nasal regurgitation and maybe at risk of aspiration. Respiratory muscles ultimately involved resulting in uh, decreased breath holding time and difficulty in respiration. Uh, Jenkins and Osman classified it functionally and regionally graded them as per the severity where grade one, only the eyes were affected, grade 2A where there was a mild generalized weakness responsive to treatment, grade 2B where it was less responsive to treatment, grade 3 where there was severe generalized disease and then a grade 4 myasthenia crisis requiring mechanical uh, ventilation. A few variants of myasthenic, like transient neonatal myasthenia seen in 15 to 20% of the neonates, uh, though it is self-limiting, but uh, in case neonatal emergency surgeries are required, um, then anesthetic implications are similar like in myasthenia gravis. Usually it is self-limiting in two to three months of the age. It usually goes off in Lambert. Second is the lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. Uh, this is a disease affecting the neuromuscular junction associated with few malignancies like the small cell lung cancer. Here, the muscle weakness is caused by reduced acetylcholine release from presynaptic nerve terminals. And it is in this, the uh, differentiating factor with the myasthenia is that it is very sensitive to both non-depressing and depolarizing muscle relaxants. And autonomic dysfunction is common, which is not there in myasthenia. Then coming on to the severe forms, crisis forms, myasthenia crisis and cholinergic crisis. Uh, myasthenia crisis is basically due to insufficient medication, anticholinesterases and resulting in severe weakness. And cholinergic crisis due to excessive medication may lead to severe episodes. And presentation, as I've already told, is result in all the facial uh, symptoms, bulbar symptoms, ultimately leading to respiratory distress. Cholinergic crisis, in addition, has the slug syndrome, the uh, as the pneumonia goes, salivation, lacrimation, all the muscular symptoms um, would be there. So this is basically showing the difference between the myasthenia and the cholinergic crisis. Then we come on to the diagnosis. Uh, we at our center usually have a team, a neurology team, as they usually rely mainly first line of uh, diagnosis goes with the anti-acetylcholine receptor and uh, assays for diagnosis of uh, MG. Other investigations which are required are the chest X-ray to rule out aspiration pneumonitis, CT scan chest or MRI chest to uh, diagnose any thymoma, MRI brain and CTs to exclude other causes of vulvar weakness and muscle weakness. Then ABG in cases of respiratory failure in crisis situations. Edrophonium challenge test is basically done in diagnosing MG and in differentiating myasthenic and cholinergic crisis. Uh, other tests commonly used are the rap repetitive nerve stimulation test, with 3 hertz is used for 60 seconds. And if there is a greater than 15% decrease in the amplitude of compound muscle action potential, that is considered as active. Uh, other tests are standard electrobiography we are using. Single fiber EMG uh, we use rarely. It, though it's specific, but then we come on to the treatment of uh, myasthenia, coming on to the medical management, which is the initial treatment. And it is done, uh, first line is with anticholinistic agents. The drug of choice is pyridostigmine, which is started at a dose of 30 milligram orally every three hours and may be titrated to effect even up to 120 mg per um, three hourly. And uh, it is the uh, initial treatment and pyridostigmine is uh, uh, rapidly acting and uh, has a relatively long duration and is effective. The other uh, line of therapy is with immunosuppressive drugs, steroids, and other uh, azathioprine, cyclosporine, and other drugs. Then short-term immunotherapies are used for crisis situation mainly. The intravenous immunoglobulins are used, and plasma pheresis may be used in pristhenia crisis and also in preoperative pre optimization in patients 
with respiratory involvement. Then surgical thymectomy is uh, basically to remove the antigenic stimulus by uh, removal of these myth cells and alteration in the immune regulation. It is basically used in patients who are poorly controlled with anticholinesterase agents and to correct the disturbance in the immune regulation and to induce remission. This is also depicting the treatment protocol. If there's only an ocular involvement, we do a check MRI to exclude other causes and anticholinesterase is the line of treatment. In cases of generalized anticholinesterase, we start with the anticholinesterase and evaluate for thymectomy. If it's a good risk patient with a good FRC, we go on for a thymectomy. If it's a poor, poor risk patient and involvement of respiratory, then we go on for IVIG initially and then go into the generalized protocol. In cases of crisis, definitely an ICU care, uh, maybe ventilatory support and initial uh, IVIG or a plasma pheresis is used. Uh, then we come on to the anesthetic considerations, the preoperative evaluation and preparation, uh, which is the very vital. And uh, first with the history taking to understand the recent course of the disease of the patient, onset and duration, severity of disease, what muscle groups are involved, bulbar involvement is there or no, no history of dysphagia, dysarthria, which may predispose to aspiration, respiratory muscle weakness, shortness of breath, history of dyspnea, history of presence of a thymoma, or also sometimes history of strider, positional dyspnea, uh, facial engorgement, they may uh, point towards a thymoma with the symptoms of mediastinal compression syndrome. Past history of any myasthenic crisis, exasperations, what the drug regimen the patient is on, anticholinesterase inhibitors, steroids, immunosuppressive agents. Then also careful medication history for any other medications patients is taking because uh, there are a lot of medications which may provoke exasperations will come in the further slides. Uh, we also need to screen for other coexisting diseases which may be associated uh, the thyroid abnormalities, diabetes, SLERA, and they should also be optimally controlled. These are the drugs to be avoided in myasthenia patients, the macrolide antibiotics, IV, uh, lidocaine in high doses, streptomycin, chloroquinolones, long-acting muscle relaxants, beta blockers, magnesium, procainamide. Then coming on to the physical examination, is in addition to the routine physical examination, uh, we need to basically assess the voluntary and respiratory muscle strength should be assessed, vital capacity, the timed forward arm abduction test and respiratory evaluation to rule out the inability to cuff evidence of pneumonia or retained secretions. These are a very important factors. Uh, predictive preoperative risk factors for prolonged postoperative ventilation. These are very important factors which need to be assessed preoperatively. A lot of studies have gone into these predictive preoperative risk factors. Initially, there were only four risk factors which were studied by Leventhal et al. in 1980. But now we have Liu and Vantebe at all. They have added quite a few additional preoperative risk factors, which make us decide as to what uh, post-operative preparation and planning we need to do, along with the neurologist and the team. Disease duration of greater than six years. If there is a concomitant pulmonary disease like a pre-existing COPD, major surgery where the intraoperative blood loss is expected to be greater than 1,000 ml, grade three and four myasthenia. Uh, in the pulmonary function test, a peak inspiratory pressure of less than 25 centimeter of water, vital capacity of less than 40 ml per kg or less than 2 to 2.9 liters, pyridostigmine in doses of greater than 750 mg per day, the acetylcholine receptor antibody levels greater than 100 nanomoles per ml, uh, and also in the RNST, uh, greater than 18 to 20 percent decremental response. Symptoms of mediastinal compression syndrome, bulbar symptom, and a history of myasthenia crisis. So all these things need to be uh, actively screened preoperatively, and a plan has to be made preoperatively for all uh, this. Then we come on to the preoperative investigations. Uh, in addition to the regular blood investigations, we need a chest X-ray, a CT scan of the chest, pulmonary function test to assess the respiratory muscle strength, negative inspiratory pressure, and post vital capacity. Also, in cases of mediastinal thymoma, the extent to understand the extent of respiratory obstruction, flow volume loops, maximal inspiratory and expiratory flow volume loops will in supine as well as upright position to measure the extent of the respiratory impairment as well as uh, whether the impairment is fixed or dynamic. Echocardiography. Then come on to the preoperative optimization. 
Optimization of the patient's strength and especially respiratory function is vital. Uh, tapering of immunosuppressive agents as far as possible to reduce the possibility of infection. Anticholinesterase agents to be discontinued uh, on the morning of surgery to decrease the need for muscle relaxants. And though, if continued along with needs adequate atropinization, IVIG and plasma paresis have a role in cases patients undergoing thymomectomy for short-term preoperative clinical improvement. Steroid-dependent patients do require a perioperative coverage. Counseling and psychological support to the patient is very important. And surgery for such patients should be scheduled as early as in the day as possible when the patients are strongest and as the day passes, the fatigue increases. So uh, on individual drugs, response to anesthetic drugs in these patients, uh, they are typically sensitive to non depressing neuromuscular blockers. Priming or defasciculation is usually not appropriate because it may result in loss of airway protection or in respiratory distress. Long-acting muscle relaxants, oh, pancuronium, tubercarinate, etc. should be avoided. Very small doses and residual drug effect may result in respiratory distress. So usually we go on for short-acting or intermediate-acting relaxants. Atracurium we use commonly and can be... Uh, used and a pre-induction period after oh, yeah. monitoring with a T4-T1 ratio of less than 0.9 and gradually titrated small doses so that uh, the important point is that we should basically do a neuromuscular monitoring and talk during intubation, surgical relaxation as well as reversal. Uh, if neuromuscular block is absolutely necessary, uh, rocuronium or vecuronium are good enough and reversal with sugamadex. Then depolarizing neuromuscular blockers Patients with the myasthenia are resistant to neuromuscular blockage with depolarizing relaxants like succinylcholine as succinylcholine is metabolized by cholinesterase and treatment with anticholinesterase medication definitely prolongs the effects of this. Also, there are higher chances of phase 2 neuromuscular block, especially with repeated doses of succinylcholine. Coming on to the intravenous anesthetic agents, uh, barbiturate and propofol have been used uh, uneventfully. Propofol definitely is the uh, preference uh, because of its short duration of action, rapid recovery, most commonly used. Then opioid analgesics uh, actually do not depress the neuromuscular transmission in the myasthenic muscle, but yes, definitely central respiratory repression may be a problem in patients already having respiratory involvement. So we use short-acting fentanyl is the most commonly and most commonly available. Revifentanyl is a good option. Etomidate and ketamine are other IV agents used uneventfully in myasthenia patients? And then we come on to the regional anesthesia. In regional anesthesia, local anesthetics do decrease the sensitivity of the post-junctional membrane. Ester anesthetics, which are metabolized by cholinesterase, are avoided because they result in prolonged block. Low dose of amide anesthetics like bupivacaine and ropivacaine can be easily used. Coming on to the anesthetic management goals are basically to prevent any prolonged effects on the respiratory and the bulbar muscles and to allow rapid recovery at the end of surgery. So the anesthesia um, management plan basically depends on the type of surgery, whether it's an emergency elective, major surgery, severity of disease. Most commonly patients with myasthenia present for a thymomectomy or uh, maybe other surgeries also um, for the anesthesia plan, whether to use a regional or a GI regional, anytime better if it is applicable as per the surgery and uh, just reduced doses of it, amide local anesthetics would be avoided, would be used, and it is definitely superior in post-op analgesia also. in the pulmonary function. Uh, GF required should have a op preoperative optimization and as avoidance of relaxants. Then we come on to the second is the intubation versus LMA. Uh, definitely uh, LMA if possible in, and if indicated in the case because uh, it will reduce the need for muscle relaxants. Then I'll come on to the pre-medication. Anticholinergic pre-medication is important. Anxiolytic, sedative, and opioid pre-medication in titrated doses uh, in patients with respiratory distress and bulbar involvement and mediastinal compression, those should be avoided but only in patients with ocular symptoms or short-acting benzodiazepine can be used. In patients who are on corticosteroids, a pre-op cover is required at induction. Coming on to the general anesthesia technique, awake versus an anesthetized intubation. 
in patients who are at risk of potential airway obstruction in cases of mediastinal thymoma, uh, definitely an awake fiber optic intubation in preferably a propped up or a sitting position is advisable maintaining the spontaneous ventilation. Mm, in other cases, even an anesthetized intubation can be done. So using a standard balanced uh, general anesthesia, intravenous or inhalational without the use of muscle relaxant. Then other things like multimodal analgesia is very important. Uh, like thoracic epidural analgesia plus G is a very good option in thymomectomy. Regional anest uh, analgesia for postoperative to maintain the pulmonary function. Then come on to TIVA or inhalational anesthetic. That is uh, total intravenous anesthesia or inhalational. Uh, commonly used are the uh, combinations of propofol and fentanyl, sufentanyl and propofol. Propofol definitely uh, for short duration of action. Also other agents which reduce the reflexes in response to laryngoscopy and intubation can be used so that we can avoid the muscle relaxants. IV lidocaine, small doses of short-acting opioids, esmolol, uh, muscle relaxants, obviously absolute omission unless absolutely necessary should avoid. If they are essential, a quantitative frame of four neuromuscular monitor should be used. Inhalational anesthetics may also cause profound muscle relaxation and maintain deep levels of tracheal intubation and with inhalational also. Desflurane and sevoflurane having low blood solubility and rapid elimination and quick neuromuscular transmission recovery are the agents of choice. Whether to reverse or not. Uh, Sugamadex, rather than neostigmine, Sugamadex basically is a medication which can be used to reverse neuromuscular blockage of the steroidal uh, neuromuscular blocking, non depolizing blocking agents, vecurinum and rocturinum by encapsulation, so without the need of any anticholinistic medication. We do not have availability of Sugamadex very often, so we more normally use neostigmine. Uh, neostigmine should be used in a titrated dose. So that, and with the, along with TOF monitoring and all the reversal, extubation, everything should be along with quantitative TOF monitoring so that the T4, T1 ratio monitoring of greater than 0.9. Coming on to the extubation, uh, anesthetic strategy uh, is to maximize the possibility of extubation by use of short-acting anesthetics and multimodal analgesia. The criteria of extubation are similar to all other cases. Just what is important is neuromuscular monitoring. Post-operative considerations, ventilatory parameters need vigilant monitoring as these patients have a propensity of developing respiratory failure. Uh, patients undergoing thymectomy many times require long duration, mechanical ventilation also. There may be weakness after surgery, maybe due to crisis, myasthenia or cholinergic, Effect, residual effects of anesthetic drugs, even non-anesthetic drugs which uh, exacerbate the situation can also be resulting in the situation. Preoperative consultation with patients neurologist should include planning for postoperative care, possibility of intensive care and a postoperative. So we have a team of neurologists, pulmonologist, and intensivist and along that we usually plan it pre-hand that all those patients who would require a post-op ICU stay and uh, monitoring uh, post-operatively also. So perioperative myasthenia crisis, the reasons for perioperative myasthenia crisis are basically can be stress of surgery, infection, residual anesthetics, withholding or tapering of these medications and number of other medications also. So the features of impending crisis are like increase in respiratory rate with shallow tidal volume breaths. These are basically signs of impending respiratory failure, which can be monitored. Uh, diagnosis uh, in nitrophonium test can be differentiated between uh, myasthenia and uh, cholinergic crisis. Formal neurophysiological studies may also be necessary. Treatment of myasthenia crisis should be coordinated with a neurologist. If weakness is there at the end of surgery, delay of extubation should be there, post-operative ICU care, and an urgent rapid therapy with plasma exchange and an IVIG, preferably should be used. Uh, Preoperative cholinergic crisis is basically because of patients who receive anticholinesterides and are at risk of uh, when we are using the reversal agents and are at risk of cholinergic uh, symptoms, paradoxical weaknesses there along with symptoms of sludge may occur after administration of reversal agent. Avoiding the neuromuscular blocking agents avoids the need for reversal and therefore the risk of 
cholinergic crisis. Treatment is with atropine and glycopylate. Anticholinesterase should be withheld. And a repeated dosing of anticholinergic may also be required. Then a brief about pregnancy and myasthenia gravis. Obstetric myasthenic patients should also be assessed preoperatively in a similar manner to assess if there is a bulbar involvement or a respiratory muscle weakness. Uh, also to assess the predicted ability to tolerate a mid-thoracic level of regional anesthetic block, which is usually required in these patients. For labor analgesia, neuraxial is the analgesia of choice. Uh, as it eliminates the need of systemic opioid administration and minimizing the respiratory depression. Instrumental delivery is common in these patients as because in the second stage of labor, use with the use of striated muscle, which may weaken and increasing the need for instrumental delivery. So in that also, neuraxial analgesia is preferable. Then coming on to the cesarean section, uh, spinal and epidural both, uh, but a mid-thoracic level of anesthesia is required, which often affects the accessory muscles of respiration. So for patients with significant bulbar or respiratory compromise, general anesthesia should be performed for cesarean section. Now we come on to the take home message. So preoperative evaluation and optimization with the help of a multidisciplinary team is vital. Regional anesthesia versus general anesthesia. Regional anesthesia definitely if the surgery indicates, but general anesthesia and a balanced technique without the use of muscle relaxants uh, can be done. GA, TIVA versus inhalational, uh, both uh, are good. Uh, important is to remember all drug interactions and all drugs to avoid. Neuromuscular monitoring, quantitative TOF, preoperative, intraoperative, as well as postoperative is vital. Multimodal postoperative analgesia regional would be very vital. Postoperative monitoring is important. <coughs> Patients may need ventilation, so vigilance is very important. Thanks. Over Thank to you. the chairpersons, please. Thank you, Simita. I think it was very lucid, as well as you have touched the every aspect of my senior gravis uh, from labor everything. Um, is there any questions in chat box? Mind? Special benefit yes. of using cis attracturium in patients of myasthenia gravis. A question by Dr. Shubendu Sarkar. Uh, the Amiga? question is, any special benefit from cis-hetracurium rather than other anesthetic agent to Dr. Semika, Dr. Lina, and Dr. Subodh? Hello? Is it audible? Yes, yes. Uh, Semika, yeah. can you hear? It is audible. Dr. Semika, please unmute yourself. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, audible. Any special reason for using cis atracurium cis atracurium can also be used it is an intermediate acting uh, but it there is definitely an increased uh, resistance to cis atracurium as well for uh, with the use of uh, in patients with myasthenia is management management of a huge thymoma compressing the airway as well as the great vessels? Uh, in a big thymoma, definitely airway is also a very big concern mm -hmm. and preoperative optimization is very important uh, because we might need, there are highest chances of post-operative uh, ventilation. So pre-op preparation, even uh, maybe uh, short doses of IVIG also initially, and uh, the management of anesthesia is important. We would prefer an awake uh, fiber optic intubation plan for this patient with the local anesthetics, anesthetizing the airway and a proper planning would be essential. And post-operatively high chances of uh, mechanical ventilation. So planned ICU care, post-operative ventilation plan, and maybe requirement for uh, um, maybe plasma paresis or these things post-operatively avoiding of any muscle relaxants intraoperatively, continuous uh, neuromuscular uh, monitoring throughout the procedure. All these things are important. 
right the next question is uh, by dr varsha patil uh, how much maximum dose of anticholinergic we can give if necessary uh, how much maximum dose of anticholinergic anticholinergic we can give if necessary uh, uh what anticholinergic i didn't atropine or glycopyrrolate what maximum dose of anticholinergic we can give to any patient for myasthenic crisis i think she is about to ask okay okay yeah for i think she is asking for myasthenic crisis hello you can see the question in the chat box Uh, we initially start with 0.4 mg uh, IV atropine, but can be used in repeated doses. And I think up to almost uh, one, I think one mg per kg. I'm not really sure about the doses exact about this, but can be used in repeated doses of maybe three up to three mg. I think. Okay, Doctor Subodh yeah. Chaturvedi is asking about for thymectomy. Is it a good idea to use thoracic epidural with minimal doses of cisetracurium? Yes, definitely. Yes. For thymectomy, uh, thoracic epidural analgesia would be very supportive and would you reduce the need of any muscle relaxant. So, along with that, a TIVA with multimodal analgesia with the thoracic epidural would be effective. Yeah, and can we go on a bypass machine if the compression is too much? Yes, definitely. That would be very vital in such a case, and should be uh, available if we suspect a mediastinal compression syndrome. Sort of. Right. Uh, any questions for uh, for the chairpersons? Mm, there is no specific question. Okay. Okay. With the permission of the chairperson, should we move to, move to the can atropine for atropine? Can be Doctor Sarkar is asking. Mm -hmm. We can give up to Doctor. Uh, he is saying for atropine we can go up to three mg. Fifteen milligram. I think he is saying With that the... we can give up to three milligram of atropine. Yes. Yeah. With the permission of the chairpersons, uh, can we go on to the next topic? Yeah, we can go to the next topic. Yes, I think the presentation was very Any nice. Any other questions, Doctor Lila, in the chat box? Sure, sir. <coughs> uh, about drug interactions. Drug interactions with Dr. what? Doctor Renuka, uh, they have not mentioned this as drug interactions. Doctor Renuka has asked about the drug interaction. Okay, Doctor Sibika, okay. are you audible? Yes. Uh, am I audible? She's asking for yeah. what all yeah, drug yeah. interactions could be there. Uh, drug interactions, as I told, a few drugs which uh, interact are uh, aminoglycosides, macrolide antibiotics. They all increase the myasthenic weakness. Then fluoroquinolones. These are a few drugs. Antiarrhythmics, uh, procainamide, magnesium. These are all drugs which would increase the weakness. So these are the drugs which we should avoid. It's not necessary that they will be uh, causing this in all patients, but these are drugs we should be avoiding. Okay. Uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, with the permission of the chairpersons, can we now move to the next topic? Yes, I think. Yeah, we'll we can move to the next one. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Sibika, Dr. Lina, and Dr. Subodh. It was an interesting discussion. And now we move on to the next topic. The next topic is about traumatic brain injury. And our presenter is Dr. Vinod Kagrari. <clears throat> May I first introduce the chair, <clears throat> chairperson for this particular topic. <clears throat> the first chairperson for this particular topic is respected Dr. Savita Sadi Madam. She is a senior professor and head of the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care from PGIMS Rohtak Haryana. She has got numerous publications. She has been faculty in various national, zonal, and state conferences. And she is also an examiner in various universities and national board of examination as well. Her specific area of interest are in obstetric and pediatric anesthesia, as well as airway management. Please welcome on board Dr. Savita Sadi, Madam, please. Madam, good evening. 
गुड इवनिंग दाओ एम आई ऑडिबल यस मैडम वेलकम 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 मैडम the second chair person for this particular topic is our very old respected dr vikas gupta sir he has done his mbbs from raipur as well as his <coughs> anesthesia degree from gwalior he has got huge amount of anesthesia a huge amount of experience in cardiac anesthesia and minimally invasive awake cardiac surgeries he has been a senior resident in the hospital gtp at UC, ucms hospital delhi as well as an associate consultant in cardiac anesthesia at chhl hospital in dhar for 5 years at present he is on a designation of consultant cardiac anesthesiology and ot superintendent at apollo hospital in dhar he has taken the indore city branch of isa to extremely high levels under his leadership of honorary secretary he is currently the honorary secretary of isa indor city branch our indor city branch has achieved new heights he has also been awarded the respected dr s k mukherjee national health award again the topics of interest are minimally invasive cardiac surgery please welcome our board dr vikas gupta good evening dr vikas gupta good evening everyone good evening ma'am good evening we uh, are now respect the uh, we are now request the respected chairpersons to please introduce the speaker to us sure shall i take yeah yeah sure ma'am please okay uh good evening a very good evening to dr sadhana dr mayank and all the organizing team and to everyone whosoever is participating in this webinar including all the speakers and co chair persons uh dr uh, for the present talk dr vinod gagrani is the speaker who is consultant at medanta medis medicity gurgaon who has done his studies at jabalpur and uh, his he did his diploma and a cfa at mgm indore and then dnb at new delhi he practiced in uh, new delhi for quite some time he has been in apollo hospital as well and presently working at uh, as consultant medanta medicity gurgaon so he would be presenting talk on traumatic brain injury we all know traumatic brain injury is an important cause of morbidity and mortality and it really requires a critical care management in in the perioperative period and it has substantial effect or impact on the society because of the financial implications as well so i now invite dr vinod gagrani to present the talk on traumatic brain injury dr vinod please Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Am I audible, Mike? Yes, you are. Yes, yes, yes. So, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this platform. So, today I will be presenting a talk on traumatic brain injury. I will be mainly focusing on the practical aspects of traumatic brain injury. So, this is the place where we work in. This is Medanta, the Medicity, Gurugram. So first of all I move on to the definition of traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injury is basically an external mechanical force applied to the cranium and the intracranial contents and this leads to a temporary or permanent impairment of functional or functional disability or psychosocial maladjustment. It can also lead to concussion, coma, death and after trauma it produces effects that may continue for a long time. so it really requires a multimodal management initially it will require emergency management later on it will require more of a rehabilitative management so many teams are involved like physiotherapists the emergency people neurologists neurosurgeons it's basically a team work so traumatic brain injuries are at the forefront causing significant number of deaths hospitalization disability and socio economic losses incidence is increasing in lower income countries and world health organization prediction is that by 2020 traumatic brain injury and road traffic accident will be the third greatest cause of death and injury worldwide and by 2030 road traffic accident will be the fifth leading cause of death in india so the magnitude of head injury in india unfortunately the data is very limited we don't have really have very good registries there is lack of good quality population based information there is absence of community based epidemiological studies 
and trauma registries are absent in India. So the awareness is increasing, but still it has to translate into real data generation. So this is just the data from Ministry of Home Affairs, States, Police and other stakeholders who have generated this data. Overall, what I want to present is that the problem is quite huge. This is the amount of traffic accidents. It is 42.9%. And it's a huge... Uh, it's a huge problem, which is uh, which causes a lot of deaths. Traumatic brain injuries in India in 2014. So, out of these were the amount of cases of traumatic brain injury. These many were hospitalized, and it led to 50,000 deaths. Now, first and foremost thing that I would like to say about traumatic brain injury is that it should never be considered in isolation. Traumatic brain injury patient is never really an isolated case of traumatic brain injury. It's a case of trauma. So usual presentation of traumatic brain injury is in the form of road traffic accidents or the patients may present as fall from height. Sometimes aged patients may just present fall not from height, means just they tripped over something and they just fell down. So that may also lead to traumatic brain injury. And last one, brain shot injuries. These are the four basic, four major heads in which traumatic brain injuries can be classified. There can be others, but these are the four major things. So the management of head injury. Head injury, generally, this is the way we, uh, it was managed. This is the old way and this is the new way. The old way was you rush to a nearest hospital. The resuscitation, usually it was inadequate. Then the patient used to be wheeled to the OT, but again, because there were no proper procedures laid down, so there were surgical delays, omissions, there were no proper monitorings, and there was a delay in rehabilitation procedure, uh, rehabilitation practices, and so ultimate outcome was not very good. The new way is that there is a dedicated trauma center, a full resuscitation unit, surgeries are carried out 24 hours a, uh, a day, and CT scan facilities have become more available. There are better monitoring facilities. There is an integrated rehabilitation. And so the outcome is good. And even otherwise, studies have shown that uh, centers who have dedicated trauma care units produce better results in case of traumatic brain injuries. So the management of head injury would can be classified into four parts. First one is at site. Second one is at during transport. Third one would be in the hospital. And fourth one would be in the neuro ICU. And this one, if you want to really mention it, it would be rehabilitation and you know integrating the patient into the society once again. Now, the sad reality of our country, we all know that we don't really have facilities to provide care on site. And the facilities to provide care during transport is also at quite its infancy. We are still developing it. The awareness is really increasing people are becoming aware that, okay, these facilities have to be provided, but still it has to translate into reality. One of the biggest problem is the finance. You see who finances all these things before the patient reaches the hospital. But anyway, the awareness is increasing. I hope that in the future, people would, uh, things would develop in a way where we can provide better care during transport and even in the pre-hospital period. So how do we, once the patient has landed in the hospital, now, how do we suspect that he is having traumatic brain injury? First of all, it would be the mechanism of injury. The first thing that we should uh, really look into is that how did the injury really happen? What kind of fall it was? If it was a road traffic accident, how was the patient hit? Was it from behind? Was it from the sides? How was it a head-on injury? All the mechanism of injury is really important. The second would be the level of consciousness. What is the level of consciousness of the patient? If the patient... Uh, presence with amnesia, if the patient, uh, patient is already unconscious, definitely he has suffered some kind of a head injury. If the patient already has, you know, he is uh, quite disoriented and you have done the preliminary test like glucose and everything, then uh, and still the patient remains unconscious despite of having a good glucose level and everything. So you can suspect that he is having a traumatic brain injury. The third one would be obviously the pupillary size and reactivity. Patient has come to you, he is already unconscious, there is no one accompanying him and patient cannot give any history, you can always look at the pupil size and the reactivity. The motor functions. 
the patient has presented to you okay he was walking talking everything was fine in the uh, pre trauma period he he has presented to you he doesn't know anything he is already disoriented but you find that one of his limbs is not working he is having hemiparesis he is having paraparesis all these things can uh, sorry paraparesis would be more of a spinal cord trauma but uh, if he is having any kind of paresis you can always uh, you should always go ahead and investigate for traumatic brain injury then thirdly it would be glasslocoma scale glasslocoma scale as we all know it depends on three signs uh, ocular signs motor signs and verbal response and it is this is basically we all know, we are all i think quite aware about the glasslocoma scale it would be eye opening four spontaneous eye opening three to speech two to pain and one nil the motor response would be that the patient obeys all commands that would be six if he localizes only to pain it would be five if he withdraws on pain it would be four abnormal flexion would be three extends that is decelerate posturing it would be two and if it doesn't uh, get any motor response then it is no similarly there is a classification of verbal response that is five is oriented four is uh, confused conversation three is inappropriate words two is incomprehensible sounds and one is that he doesn't respond at all so the minimum score would be three and maximum would be 15 similarly there are scores for children's uh, coma scale because they obviously the children would not be able to uh respond by verbal response this is the children's coma scale so what is the primary management the primary management would be once the patient lands up in the hospital so first of all complete the ar abcs the abcs in this particular case will have to be completed with care of the icp and possible cervical fracture so how do we complete the acps so uh, abcs sorry so first of all the drugs that we use we have to take care that the drugs that we use are not going to increase the icp and secondly the techniques that we use for control of the airway should not possibly disturb the cervical spine so we should always take care of the possibility of the cervical spine fracture so the most uh, basic thing would be that if we want to really intubate the patient we don't use head tilt maneuver we use the jaw thrust maneuver uh, so the drugs that we will be using usually we use propofol and fentanyl okay literature mentions that fentanyl can cause high icp but still it is always better to relieve pain because pain will also cause an increase in icp so almost for all practical purposes if there is no allergy or anything we use propofol and fentanyl thirdly the ventilation once we have intubated there is always a tendency to you know hyperventilate the patient like anything that is harmful we should always go for normal ventilation third uh, fourth would be euvolemia as we all all know that hypovolemia actually goes on to cause a higher icp so we should always and the patient of trauma as i always uh, as i already mentioned that uh, a patient of traumatic brain injury is not only traumatic brain injury it's a case of trauma so euvolemia is important the patient always has other injuries by which he may have developed hypovolemia already fourth would be arterial hypotension systolic blood pressure of below 90 should be avoided so we can volume resuscitate the patient and we can use inotropes and we should avoid a bp of below 90 cerebral perfusion pressure of should be of 60 to 70 and not above 70 the primary management of traumatic brain injury would be to rule out any kind of life threatening issues so to rule out the life threatening issues we used uh, we generally check the check for the if the patient is already intubated by the time he has come to the triage so we check the endotracheal in, uh, intubation whether the bilateral arentry is equal whether the ventilation is good rule out pneumothorax rule out hemothorax rule out hemopericardium apply cervical collar watch for ongoing blood losses so we should always look into the abdominal injuries the pelvic injuries and the femur fracture femur fracture these are the major causes of uh, blood loss in these uh, patients so for this we can always use a use a fast evaluation if it is available in your triage usually in our triage we always go for a complete ultrasound uh, of the abdominal chest so fast evaluation although it is mentioned in literature we generally don't do it because it is already uh, the patient has already been received in the triage and he is usually evaluated by ultrasound examinations so the primary management would be to uh, establish iv access 
to establish an arterial line, police catheterization, cardiac monitoring, two large bore IVs are uh, inserted. Central lines, if the generally central lines in the in these cases, we go on for a femoral line. Second would be to conduct preliminary investigations. The minimum basic investigations would be arterial blood gases and coagulation profile. We usually send the complete CBC, KFT, everything, all the routine examinations are sent. But if you are in a hurry and if the patient is to be taken up urgently, we can go for a minimum arterial blood gas and coagulation profile. Definitely there is no time for a very detailed history. So we go for a very focused history. And so we can should rule out recent cardiac uh, interventions, if they have been performed, if the patient has undergone uh, some kind of cardiac problems recently, if he has been recently started on any kind of medications, if he has undergone recent interventions, chronic valvular problems, uh, valvular problems, any kind of heart problems which he has faced since the childhood, use of blood thinners. Usually the patient remember if they are on blood thinners, any kind of allergies. When, once we are finished with all these things, we should get the blood ready if needed. And the blood should be according to the above history. If the patient is already on blood thinners, we should be arranging uh, more blood. We should be arranging if the patient is, suppose he, uh, he is already on aspirin and clopidogrel. The usual uh, thing would be also to arrange plate, uh, platelets. If uh, time allows, then we can always arrange SDPC. Otherwise, our lab is already all, uh, always ready with RDPCs. Appropriate consent. So in accordance to this, this history, if the patient is already on uh, some kind of blood thinners, if the patient is... Uh, so according to this history, we can take appropriate uh, consent. And again, I would reiterate the use of cervical collar. Patient should always be having cervical collar because till now we have not ruled out any kind of cervical injury. So the primary management would be to give 10 to 20% intravenous mannitol. So it would be 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram. Uh, hypertonic saline, 3%, 2 to 5 ml per kilogram over 10 to 20 minutes. This can be an alternative to mannitol. Refractory ICP, we can always give a bolus of 23.4% hypertonic saline if it is available. It is not available in our institute. Usually the uh, target is to create an uh, osmotic uh, pressure of 295 to 305. That should be a head and elevation of 30 to 45 degrees. Hyperventilation to a PACA2 of 26 to 30 millimeter of mercury. This is only an emergency measure because prolonged uh, hypo, uh, hyperventilation below 25 is not recommended. That it is no use of hyperventilation beyond 24 hours. And if SGO, uh, that is uh, jugular venous oximetry or uh, is used, these are the modalities which can be used to monitor hyperventilation. Avoid high thoracic pressures. This is also important, as I told you, that uh, as soon as we intubate the patient, there is usually a tendency to hyperventilate the patient like anything. This can cause an increase in thoracic pressure and this can cause further increase in ICP. This should be avoided. Avoid neck vein compression. Again, this is one of the ignored things because as soon as we apply the cervical collar, it tends to cause neck vein compression. So we should always take care that the cervical collar is put in such a way that neck veins are not compressed. Again, there is always a possibility that the patient's neck may be lying in a flexed condition. This should also be avoided. So the primary management. Now, once we are finished with the triage uh, work, we can always wheel the patient to the CT scan area. So CT scan area, we uh, in our institute, we usually do a head to pelvis CT scan in one go. So this usually takes care of uh, we can rule out all the traumatic brain injuries. We can rule out the cervical fractures. We can evaluate pneumothorax, hemothorax. We can evaluate the abdominal injuries. We can uh, evaluate the, whether the patient has got hemoperitoneum, pneumoperitoneum. Uh, uh, if the facility of head to pelvis CT scan is not available, usually there should be a facility to get an NCCT head and neck done along with a chest X-ray, along with an ultrasound abdomen. This will also take care of evaluating all the compartments in which there can be an internal bleed or where there can be an internal injury. Now, after this, once we have evaluated what the what all injuries the patient has, and we are sure that okay, now we are dealing only with brain injury. 
now how to reduce the icp once we can always go for a uh, ventriculostomy that is an external ventricular drain can be placed decompressive craniectomy can be done if it is indicated it is uh, the studies have shown that decompressive craniectomy lowers the icp up to 15% opening of the dura in addition to the br uh, bony skull results in an average decrease in icp of 70% now we come to the classifications of traumatic brain injury the primary brain, uh, injuries would be cranial and intracranial cranial uh, injuries would can be mostly fractures the intracranial injuries would be hematomas contusions concussions diffuse external injuries and there can be foreign bodies like bullets or shrapnels the secondary brain uh, uh, cl uh, class classification of secondary brain injuries would be due to excitatory amino acids excitatory opioids high icp cerebral edema hydrocephalus hydrocephalus and uh, combined with uh, cerebral edema and high icp can result in brain herniation and chronic traumatic encephalopathy out of all these things these are the three highlighted in red of which we can do something so after we have completed with the emergency we can move out to the non emergent man management of uh, Uh, traumatic brain injury out of this uh, these are the major elements of brain trauma found uh, major elements of the recommendation of brain trauma foundation first is about tracheostomy the brain trauma foundation the recommends that early tracheostomy is recommended in our institute generally if the patient remains intubated for 72 hours and if uh, he is not improving further we generally go in for a tracheostomy deep venous thrombosis so it is recommended that as soon as the patient is reasonably stabilized we start uh, the prophylaxis for deep venous thrombosis usually in our institute when uh, if the patient is the traumatic brain injury is reasonably stabilized and if the surgeons are reasonably sure that okay there can be no further edema there can be no further uh, uh, bleed we usually start uh, the prophylaxis for deep venous thrombosis uh, within 72 hours Uh, post traumatic seizures so the recommendation is that uh, phenytoin should be started it decreases the incident incidence of early post traumatic seizures and post traumatic seizures means within 7 days of injury there is no evidence of use of any kind of anti epileptic drugs for late seizure prevention and that uh, as far as the controversy between uh, levi uh, use of levipil and phenytoin is concerned uh, there is uh, no study which demonstrates that both these drugs are any different the target bp should be usually above 100 mm of mercury or uh, means it should be in accordance to the age from 5 to 69 years uh, of age it should be above 100 uh, 100 mm of mercury and uh, 15 to 49 years of age it should be 11 uh, 110 mm of mercury as far as feeding is concerned feeding should be started as early as possible at least by the fifth day and maximum by the seventh day so transgastric or jejunal feeds can be uh, instituted if it is uh, required usually we start feeding amalgam we uh, generally don't keep the patient nil by mouth unless and until it is, it is mandated due to injuries or it is mandated due to the Uh, if the patient is being planned for surgery or something like that otherwise we usually have a nasogastric tube in situ and we start feeds as soon as possible now as far as timing of cranioplasty is concerned cranioplasty once the patient is stabilized and he has uh, all the usually after two months or so surgeons usually go for cranioplasty no use of icp monitors indications of icp monitoring so moderate to severe head injury who cannot be seriously uh, assessed neurologically or the patient are paralyzed or they have ocular trauma or cataract surgeries by uh, by virtue of which they cannot be examined by pupillary examination such patient should go icp monitoring any patients who have got severe uh, head injury with gcs of less than 8 or abnormal ct scan severe head injury of gcs less than 8 plus normal ct plus any of the two of uh, these are present that is age is above 40 years or bp is below 90 mm of mercury or there is abnormal motor posturing all these patients can undergo icp monitoring so these are the various ways we can measure the icp one is the intraparenchymal uh, electrode second is ventricular catheter third one can be a epidural monitor and fourth one can be a uh, icp bolt 
So what are the benefits of ICP monitoring? ICP monitoring, it is a uh, cerebral perfusion pressure guided therapy. If the patient is unconscious and we are not very sure whether he should be going a decompressive craniectomy, again, we can use the CPP guided therapy. It is very easy to measure. Both number and waveforms are uh, visible and it is a continuous measure. What are the risks and limitations of ICP, manage, uh, ICP monitoring? First of all, it is invasive. This is one of the biggest deterrents because surgeons are always uh, wary of using it because it is an invasive thing. We may be introducing an infection when it is not already present. Second is intracranial bleeding. But the percentage of uh, bleeding is only less than 3%. Infections, malfunctions, or measurement error then it can be misleading because it is not a global measurement. The ICP monitor measures the ICP only at the point where it is inserted. All the other places, sometimes it can be uh, telling you that, okay, there is no high ICP, but rest of the brain may be having a more ICP than what is being measured. No RCTs are there in fa uh, favor. So no randomized controlled trials in favor of ICP monitoring. Some studies have even reported worse outcome. Then there are different limitations because the, some of the monitoring cannot be calibrated. They are subject to drift. They do not allow CSF drainage. The, uh, as far as external ventricular drain is uh, concerned, they require as a expertise and resource availability for placement. Now we come to the indications of decompressive craniectomy and uh, traumatic brain injuries. First, it is comatose patient with acute SDH with brain swelling in the first 24 hours. Comatose patient with parenchymal hemorrhage or contusions, usually frontotemporal contusions with substantial mass effect with midline shift of more than 5 mm. When the ICP becomes difficult to control above 22 mm of mercury or if they deteriorate neurologically with radiological evidence of increasing mass effect. Then gunshot wound, clear indication that there is a foreign body inside, so it has to be taken out. Severe blast injury with gross swelling. So so these are all these uh, recommendations are in accordance with the three trials, three famous trials, DECRA trial, rescue ICP trial, and rescue ACDS trials. Now the indication of MRI, T2 weighted flare, T2 gradient eco MRI sequences in early and post injury. So usually MRI is used to rule, uh, to establish or rule out diffuse external injury. The patient is lying in the ICU and uh, okay, there are no acute injuries. The hematomas are not increasing. There are no major contusions to be removed. Brain swelling is not much, but the patient is still not waking up. In this usual uh, conditions, we go for an MRI, generally to rule out diffuse external injuries. Then we come to neuro rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, so again, we want the patient to go back to his employment, go back to the family, go back to the community and the society, and be an active member of the society. These are all the goals of rehabilitation. So the rehabilitation process involves team efforts. The integrated neuro rehabilitation team should consist of rehabilitation physician, neuropsychologist, speech and language pathologist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, rehabilitation nurse. So there is a full team involved. The patients who need rehabilitation would be more than 1.5 million a year. Less than 10 integrated multidisciplinary in uh, patient rehabilitation facilities are there in our country. And although long-term rehabilitation services are available, these are not enough to provide optimal care and to all those who need it. So we really need, again, an integrated approach to provide rehabilitative care. Again, something which is in his infancy. We have got people, uh, we have got people who, can, who are trained enough to deal with traumatic brain injury, but that is not the end. The person must be, uh, be really going back to the society. That should be our goal. So those services are really in their infancy and they need to be developed. So these are the investigational drugs which are being reviewed. So in case of increased ICP and reduced blood flow, we already have decompressive craniectomies, but again, we need to optimize the conditions in which decompressive craniectomies should be done. Role of hypothermia, again, the Brain Trauma Foundation says that hypothermia has no major role. Progesterone, propanerol, all these drugs are being evaluated. Bleed, uh, progesterone, EPO, glibenclamide, minocycline, 
procrinolol statins all these are being evaluated for uh, bleeding and edema diffuse axonal injury progesterone epo stem cells and minocycline are being evaluated so similarly for cell death neuroprotective agents such as again progesterone glibenclamide minocycline all these are being evaluated neurovascular damage neuro restoration promoting angiogenesis neurogenesis so all these are the investigational uh, things which are yet being reviewed now as far as monitoring is concerned advanced monitoring techniques allowing the measurement of cerebral uh, physiologic metabolic parameters related to oxygen delivery and cerebral blood flow and metabolism are uh, have been developed jugular venous oximetry has already been covered normal jugular venous oximetry should be about 60% uh, and below 50% for 10 minutes uh, really means ischemic desaturation and that should not be allowed brain tissue oxygen tension monitoring and cerebral microdialysis all these things have already been covered in detail thanks a lot over to the chair persons please dr vikas and dr savita sadi madam yeah thank you dr vinod for such a illuminative lecture and presentation of a few things i would like to mention with your lectures first of all you have mentioned it's a team work that's a very good concept because it's definitely it's a very good uh, need a very good team to manage a traumatic brain injury because management in the first few hours is of utmost importance secondly you have covered very nicely in, uh, regarding history preparation and including specific consent to anticoagulants one uh, so it's a very good presentation and i have one question if you permit to you Uh, i just want to ask about your experience regarding management of hypotension associated with exclusive traumatic brain injury whether you will manage it with a floats or inotropes so usually what we the way that uh, one of my uh, seniors told me that if i have to classify hypotension or shock in case of trauma injuries if i want to label uh, mention 10 labels about hypotension in trauma injuries the first would be hypovolemic the second would be hypovolemic third would be hypovolemic fourth would be hypovolemic up till the eighth it would be hypovolemic only after that i should look for any other things that is cardiogenic shock or uh, any other kinds of shock so first eight would be hypovolemic manage it with fluids if available as uh, as soon as for example as i told you that as soon as the patient lands up in the emergency we can always send a abg and abg would give us a lot of information usually if the lactates are high we can manage it with fluids and if the hemoglobin is low means as soon as the patient lands up we can always call blood and we should be managing it with fluids preferably blood inotrop should always come secondary is there any choice of uh, fluid specific to related to traumatic brain injury usually initially it would be crystalloid colloids only once we have Resisted the resisted the patient sufficiently. We have filled in him sufficiently. Then only we go ahead with colloid. So first would always be crystalloids and blood. Blood if available, it would be very good. Crystalloids is there any Thank specific you. choice? Usually we go for normal saline because usually we are using normal saline. Ringer where I'm. Use uh, less because you know uh, if at all uh, normal saline. means at the most what it would be a hypernatremia agara if it at all induces uh, some kind of hypernatremia it would be beneficial for the patient we use normal saline mostly and what is your recommendation regarding uh, this hyperventilation hyperventilation as i said that we should be targeting normal ventilation not hyperventilation if at all we are using hyperventilation okay if the patient has come in you suspect that he is already going into herniation you can institute hyperventilation for a short period of time and it should always be a short period of time as we always know that hyperventilation actually reduces the cerebral perfusion pressure so it should be used only for a short period of time 10 to 15 minutes then it has got no role beyond 24 hours so beyond 24 hours if someone means uh, if we put a ventilatory setting which is causing hyperventilation it is actually detrimental it has got no role beyond 24 hours it is only acute management that okay by the time it is a time buying management actually okay by the time we are instituting all the other measures to reduce the icp 
you are also hyperventilating that's all okay thank you so much uh, i have got a, a query uh, in your talk first of all uh, i would like to say it was a very nice talk and lightning on such a vital topic which is such a common presenting problem to the traumatic emergency departments and everyone is facing this and usually it is a cause of uh, big chronic disabilities also uh, you mentioned in your slides uh, uh, 23.4% saline so i want to know something about it in more detail uh, as i told you uh, ma'am uh, where exactly you would like to use and is it really available and how come this much uh, i mean hypertonic saline 23.4% as i told you ma'am that this is something which i have read in the literature we have never used it 3% hey, uh, hypertonic me, saline is something i don't know 23 because 3% is at the max is the one which has been uh, usually uh, like Uh, advised advocated or being used in that too with caution with having whatever precautions one so 23.4% is exactly a very very high uh, uh, i mean the concentration which i think so any other detail in this we could uh, ma'am this is something which i have uh, means absolutely read only in the literature while i was preparing the slides uh, I, we have never I, used 23.4% saline May I can I add something? Yes. Yes, yes sir, please. Such things when you talk of about saline of twenty three percent, if you are not sure, in my opinion, they should not be presented in the slide at all. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two is Dr. Vinod, you gave an excellent presentation. I was highly impressed because you talked preoperative transport and in the emergency and later on. It's excellent way. Thanks, sir. Over two things, two points I would like to say. One was that you mentioned that it is suggested that hypothermia has no role. Absolutely right. But the aim is to keep the patient normothermic. Hyperthermia is very bad in such cases. Yeah, definitely, sir. Agreed, so sir. that is, it is not only hypothermia. You must avoid hyperthermia. Yes. So that is that is very. You did not mention about it that it is not. Yes, just, I just missed it. Normothermic and avoid hyperthermia at any cost. Yes, definitely. Another, 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 another important point was in the investigation. Blood sugar estimation should be done routinely, at least twice a day at twelve hourly intervals. in that also blood sugar should not be allowed to go beyond 100 because hypoxic insults in hyperglycemia is again a disaster that is absolutely established and it is proven so blood sugar estimation is another another important thing which must be and never allow it to go more than 100 110 milligrams thank you otherwise the, uh, the lecture was really excellent I did Thanks, many sir. things, you, many things to it. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Sorry about the twenty-four point four percent. It was a last last minute addition. I just read it somewhere and I added it. Definitely, as I said, that we have no experience on that regard. We have never used that twenty-four point four percent. Okay, okay, but that is quite interesting. That uh, it should be explored. Actually, what, uh, how it is, and how it would help in the clinical scenario. Is it? But, Anyway, thanks for uh, an excellent talk on the topic. And uh, Dr. Mayank, you can take up the questions if there are uh, th those are there in the chat box. Yes, ma'am. Surely, with your permission, Dr. Tapas Sharma is asking: Is what is the optimum ETCO2 value at blood pressure value to prevent the brain from bulging intraoperatively? No, optimum ETCO2 value generally yes. at B arterial it... pressure. Now, ETCO2 value, as I said, hyperventilation. I have just uh, told that hyperventilation is just a time buying measure. We should generally aim at normal ventilation. So below twenty six is not recommended. And in the long term, uh, means when the patient is already in the ICU, he is beyond twenty four hours. We generally don't let the ETCO2 go below thirty five. So because lowering the ETCO2 will further re actually reduce the cerebral perfusion. It will cause cerebral vasoconstriction. So, uh, 
again it's a only a time buying measure by the time you are intubating the patient by the time you are dealing with the patient in the triage and you don't have any other measure you have just intubated the patient you are just preparing with everything else you can hyperventilate otherwise don't hyperventilate it should be lower level of normal ventilation never a clear hyperventilation and hyperventilation has got no role beyond 24 hours uh, and does yes please and as far as blood pressure is concerned generally the blood pressure should not go below 90 mm of mercury systolic that is the way it is and usually the way to manage the blood pressure would be ideally initially manage hypovolemia always suspect hypovolemia in a trauma patient below means uh, before you uh, suspect anything else any other cause of shock there are two more questions the first one is if the choice of fluids of traumatic brain injury is a balanced salt solution acceptable or not usually we have experience with normal i mean sir we use saline instead of any other kind of uh, fluid and how soon dvt prophylaxis of anticoagulation should be started in post traumatic patient no as i said that as soon as uh, it is a balanced decision between a anesthetist and a surgeon or a critical care personnel and a surgeon and surgeon has a upper hand in it because he should be very sure about what kind of surgery has been done what uh, what kind of vascular structures were damaged and once the brain swelling has means a uh, brain it, there is uh, 72 hours after the so means uh, the brain cell swelling has uh, brain has stopped swelling and uh, 72 hours after the surgery usually we start chemical uh, dvt prophylaxis are there other questions by the respective people have started persons, as please? early as 24 hours okay it was an excellent talk and i thank dr uh, vinod for that thanks a lot any addition uh, by dr vikas oh that's all from my side thank you taking permission from the chairperson should we now move on to another topic dr mank ji uh, yes uh, sir i have a uh, thing to mention about the sodium i mean the nacl solution 23.4% like uh, that is like used only in neurocritical care units where it is prepared specially in the pharmacies and then it is procured that is ex exceptionally only for use in a ne neurocritical care unit and most of the studies which are performed by the i mean which have been elaborated in the brain trauma foundation guidelines are using 23.4% saline the advantage of this is it is like a very small volume usually uh, like for weight less than 50 kg uh, less than 20 ml or maximum 30 ml is required which can be given over 10 minutes as a bolus to prevent emergent uh, or impending herniation so that is the advantage of 23.4% saline in countries where it is not available we commonly use 3% saline instead of mannitol that is uh, what are the disadvantages of giving this 23.4% saline in patients ma'am uh, that uh, it should i mean precautions and what we should be prepared while giving this as a treatment a bad of osmotic demyelination syndrome that is what she has said like we have to give it at a very it uh, the bands weight by volume the volume has to be on the lower side it has to be given over a longer span of time of 30 minutes the uh, main thing is thrombophlebitis is a major complication so preferably a central line has to be used ma'am so even in an emergent situation the central line has to be present it should not be given over a per with the peripheral line and uh, whereas even 3% saline is not recommended through by a peripheral iv line and they say to further dilute it to 2% saline to be given if we don't have a central axis your view about the balanced salt solution approach in traumatic brain injury and rigor lactate in traumatic brain injury as fluid resuscitation you are asking me sir yes uh, sir why uh, balanced salt solution is the preferred and when it is not available rigor lactate what we commonly use we don't use it as a first uh, fluid but uh, we can safely give up to 1 liter of ringer lactate which will not harm but not as the initial resuscitation fluid in initial resuscitation fluid is generally normal saline and if balanced salt solutions are available then that is the preferred fluid for initial resuscitation
Bab, uh, respected chairpersons, can we please proceed yeah, to, we the can move to the next talk, please? Yeah. Thank you so much, respected Savita Sadi, Madam, respected Dr. Vikas Gupta, sir, and respected Dr. Vinod Gagrani, sir. Taking your permission, I now move on to another topic. And now I would like to invite our very own respected Professor Adil Ohri, sir. Are you here, sir? Respected, sir? Ori, sir? He's logged in, man. Uh, he, uh, for a brief introduction, he has retired as professor of Department of Anesthesia with effect from, uh, from Indra Kanti Medical College, Shimla, where he served for 10 years as head of the department. And now he is posted in the Department of Anesthesia, Bareli RMRI Hospital, as professor and head of the department. His areas of interest are pain and palliative care medicine, cardiac anesthesia, and disaster management. Welcome on board, respected Dr. Adil Hori, sir. Adil Hori, sir, are you there? Respected, sir. Hori, sir. Man, you can introduce the speaker and he is yeah, logging. Must be some internet issues. So, sure. you can introduce the speaker. Sure. I would now like to introduce the speaker of our next topic. The topic is anesthetic consideration for a case of hydrocephalus and meningomyelocele. It is Dr. Gorita Srivastava. At this present moment, she is the consultant anesthesiologist at CHL Hospital Indore. She has done her MD and DNB in anesthesia. As a DNB guide, now she is seven years old. She has presented papers at various national as well as state level conferences and is very keenly involved in academic activities at city branch level, at state level, and national level. Welcome on board, Dr. Gorita Srivastava. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Mayank. <clears throat> Shall I share the screen now? Please. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, am I audible? You are audible. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, respected seniors uh, and my dear colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm Dr. Gaurita Srivastav and uh, uh, thank you, Mayang, for involving me in this uh, academic activity for today. Uh, it's been a really informative evening uh, with all my uh, colleagues presenting on uh, neuroanesthesia and critical care. Uh, I will be speaking on the anesthetic considerations in hydrocephalus and meningomyelocele. Uh, so meningomyelocele is a complex congenital spinal anomaly which occurs because of neural tube defects during the first four weeks of gestation. The incidence is 1 in 1,000 live births with a slightly higher incidence in females, that is 1.2 is to 1. Uh, it can occur anywhere along the spinal cord, but 85% of the cases are uh, seen in the lumbosacral region. It is most commonly associated with a uh, deficiency of folic acid. So uh, administration of folic acid from the first trimester of pregnancy is known to significantly reduce its incidence. So <clears throat> the components of a meningomyelocele can be a plain meningocele, or a meningomyelocele. So the meningocele involves both the meninges, the dura and the arachnoid, without involvement of neural components, whereas a meningomyelocele will involve the neural components, nerve tissues, roots, as well as CSF. This is a diagrammatic representation of the same, wherein uh, the most uh, insidious uh, form is the spina bifida occulta, which is just a plain uh, failure of the neural tube uh, defect to fuse with no protrusion of the contents of the spinal cord. And this is next followed by a meningocele, which is showing the meninges and the meningomyelocele with the neural tube contents as well. This is a diagrammatic representation of the same. A meningomyelocele is most commonly associated with the arnold shaped malformation. This is the herniation of the cerebellar vermis through the foramen magnum. The tonsils extend down into the spinal cord and uh, this causes, this may lead to compression of the brainstem. So the lower cranial nerves run up instead of down. 
This is mostly associated with hydrocephalus in 85% of the cases and also associated with other developmental abnormalities in the cardiovascular, GI, genitourinary systems as well. Uh, a special consideration in the Arnold-Giari malformation is that utmost care must be taken during the positioning of the patient during intubation as well as extubation. And for a meningocele, there should be no pressure on the exposed neural placard. Postoperatively, these patients are very prone for strider and apnea, so a careful watch has to be kept on patients post extubation. Meningomyelocele is associated with other congenital conditions such as the club foot, bladder extrophy, prolapsed uterus, tracheoesophageal fistula, Klippelfeld syndrome, and in very rare conditions, also cardiovascular anomalies. Antenatal diagnosis of meningomyelocele is very much possible with the help of an ultrasound as depicted in the diagram and also with biochemical tests such as the alpha fetoprotein levels in maternal serum as well as amniotic fluid which are highly elevated. So what are the problems that we occur while treating patients with meningomyelocele? The most common problem is that the open neural tube uh, defect which is present is continuous with the surface of the skin. So the spinal uh, contents are exposed to the skin. So a CSF leak can commonly occur and these, uh, these infants are uh, at high risk for bacterial meningitis. So this is the most common indication for a very early operative repair. Ideally, it should be done within 48 hours of delivery to prevent infection. As the duration increases uh, for which we perform surgery, the chances of uh, neurological complications increases. This is a picture of a baby with a very huge myelomeningocele. Uh, but we must keep in mind that even after repair, especially if the repair is done at a later stage, the neurological deficit which occurs because of tethering of the spinal cord uh, could be fixed and irreversible and it may rarely improve following uh, the repair. So that has to be kept in mind and explained to the uh, relatives and the uh, patient's attendants. Uh, this could also lead to diminished control of the lower limbs, paraplegia and uh, involvement of the bowel and bladder. We next move on to hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus means literally water in the brain. These patients typically uh, present with a tense fontanel with frontal and parietal boss bossing and a positive sunset sign, as you can see in this picture. So the causes of hydrocephalus are, uh, it can be divided into two parts. That is a congenital hydrocephalus, which occurs because of intrauterine infections, the torch infections, or various congenital malformations such as the Dandy Walker syndrome, aqueductal stenosis, Arnold Chiari malformation. Then we then move on to acquired hydrocephalus, which occurs uh, in infective cases of meningitis, which could be tubercular or pyogenic or in posterior fossa tumors, arteriovelous malformations, IC bleeds, or a ruptured aneurysm, or most commonly also in trauma. So what are the imaging modalities uh, to diagnose both myelomeningocele as well as hydrocephalus? Most commonly, as I have already mentioned, uh, ultrasound is a very good diagnostic tool for uh, meningomyelocele detection. And uh, we can also use, uh, uh, MRI is commonly used because it will show the size content as well as the site of the lesion. And uh, it will show us the degree of the hydrocephalus and also may show features of raised ICP in patients who are already having hydrocephalus. So how do these patients present? Uh, most commonly, uh, uh, myelomeningocele is obviously a, a, a presentation of the pediatric population. Uh, so the features of the raised uh, intracranial pressure is what are most commonly presenting. So they have persistent vomiting, frontal bossing, dilated scalp veins, and various cranial nerve palsies. Frequent vomiting may lead to electrolyte imbalance, dehydration, and also it could increase the risk of aspiration. 
So this is the presenting of symptoms which are slightly different between infants and children. Uh, infants will present with irritability or poor feeding. Uh, whereas uh, children, uh, older children would have a headache, diplopia, uh, and vomiting. And uh, the, the difference between infants and children is mainly the sutures uh, because uh, as we all know, the, suture, the closure of sutures occurs uh, between the six months to one and a half year of age. Uh, so even spite, in spite of a raise in the intracranial tension, uh, the brain uh, see, uh, pressure does not increase and the patients do not come with uh, symptoms that fast. So they have these widely separated cranial sutures or a full fontanel and cranial enlargement. Whereas uh, in the older children, once there is fusion of the sutures, they will present very early with headache, diplopia, and uh, the cranial nerve involvement is mostly the third and the sixth cranial nerve. And there is loss of upward gaze, uh, which is called as the uh, sunset sign. So, uh, meningomyelocele and hydrocephalus are also associated with other problems such as prematurity. Uh, uh, many of these children would be uh, born prematurely, so they would have coexisting problems such as anemia, jaundice, uh, coagulopathy and coexisting cardiorespiratory disease. So, we have to address these issues as well in the preoperative period. We now move on to the treatment of uh, the um, hydrocephalus. Uh, there are two common surgical modalities. Uh, most commonly what is done are the shunt surgeries and uh, the most popular amongst them is the ventriculoperitoneal or the VP shunt as we all commonly know. Uh, the VP shunt is when the shunt is done from the ventricle into the peritoneal cavity. In case there are any chances of infection or, uh, or a, a redo surgery wherein we are repeating a VP shunt for any particular reason, then the alternative sites are the right atrium and the pleura, which are known as ventriculoatrial and pleural shunts. And the other uh, procedure is an endoscopic third ventriculostomy in which uh, a directly <coughs> shunt is placed in the third ventricle. We now move on to preoperative assessment of these patients. So obviously, uh, the main thing that we are looking for in preoperative assessment is the symptoms of raised ICP. We have to differentiate or we have to know which are the patients which have a raised ICP and we have to, uh, the, because the anesthesia management will uh, depend on that completely. Also assess their level of consciousness because children with altered mental status would be at higher risk of aspiration in the post-operative period. A thorough cardiovascular examination should be done to rule out cardiac septal defects. And a note has to be made about the preoperative anticonvulsant therapy that the patients are on because this has to be continued in the perioperative period as well. You also assess the volume status of the patient because as mentioned earlier, uh, these patients because of frequent vomiting could be hypovolemic and dehydrated and also could be having electrolyte imbalance. So a careful assessment of that and appropriate treatment of the electrolyte imbalance is also uh, is, is to be done. And also note of anemia, if at all, is to be uh, taken care of and uh, treated appropriately. Obviously, we have to keep the difficult airway cart ready. I will be talking about this in the next slides uh, because these patients are potential difficult intubations. Uh, pediatric airway as such presents uh, the following challenges to us because the, uh, because the pediatric patients have a large head and tongue uh, as compared to the rest of the body. They also have a... a overhanging or an omega-shaped epiglottis. So visualization, uh, laryngoscopy and visualization of the larynx is more difficult as compared to the adults. They have an anteriorly placed larynx and also some amount of subglottic stenosis. In addition, in hydrocephalus, uh, there is macrocephaly, that is the head circumference is increased. So this leads to, this may lead to extreme flexion of the neck, which will make positioning for laryngoscopy and intubation more difficult. So these are the challenges for the pediatric airway. Hence, when we are uh, going for anesthesia for uh, uh, hydro, uh, hydrocephalus uh, surgery, we patient, we should always have a difficult airway cart ready. So uh, what are the precautions that we take at the time of induction? 
during the uh, induction as well as throughout the surgery, the main thing is that we have to avoid any increases in the intracranial pressure. So the, um, the things which precipitate this increase are hypercapnia, hypoxia and gross variations in the mean arterial pressure. So we prevent hypercapnia as well as hypocapnia, hypoxia and uh, hyper or hypotension. Uh, we should also avoid volatile anesthetic agent induced increase in the blood flow. Uh, so an IV induction is preferred, uh, which is followed with a neuromuscular block. So in the IV induction, the most commonly used agents are pentothal or propofol. Obviously, uh, we would like to avoid ketamine because ketamine increases the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral metabolic uh, requirement, which will uh, eventually lead to an increase in the intracranial pressure. So in patients with uh, uh, hydrocephalus with uh, potential full stomach, a rapid sequence induction uh, uh, with uh, succinyl scoline can be done or rocuronium, whatever is the preference. And um, this can be, this is followed with uh, non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, most commonly used as atracurium. Uh, the attenuation of the um, uh, response to scoline can be done with defasciculating dose doses of neuromuscular blocking drugs or with opioids. Opioids such as fentanyl are commonly used to attenuate the pressure response. The other option for induction is obviously an inhalational induction if we do not have an IV line in place. So uh, an inhalational induction followed by uh, securing an IV access can also be done. During the maintenance phase, uh, we uh, have to maintain anesthesia with uh, oxygen and nitrous and uh, with the help of inhalational agents or with TIVA, whatever is the preference of the institute or the anesthetist. Uh, and uh, it, it is known that um, a MAC of less than one uh, with the volatile anesthetic agents does not increase the cerebral blood flow, so can be safely used. In patients who have raised intracranial pressure, nitrous oxide is best avoided to prevent further increase in the pressure. Atroculum boluses are given as per the dose and uh, certain uh, cases, uh, mannitol 0.25 to 1 gram per kg is also given to reduce the intracranial pressure. So throughout the surgery, we have to keep these things in mind, avoid the ri rises in the intracranial tension, maintain normocardia, mild hyperventilation as in a, a, you know, a PACO2 between 30 to 35 is beneficial, nothing less than or more than that. And we should keep in mind that if the patients are on chronic anticonvulsant therapy, then that could lead to hepatic enzymatic induction. Hence, the dose of the neuromuscular blocking agent uh, will have to be increased appropriately. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, uh, most of, I mean, a few of these patients could be premature infants. Uh, so in those patients, uh, chances of opioid overdosage is also there. Uh, hence, uh, there should be very judicious use uh, of our drugs. Adequate pain relief uh, can be given with IV analgesics as well as suppositories and um, reversal is done at the end of the surgery. Next, move on to a very important point, which is the positioning of the patient, which is a major anesthetic challenge in these cases. Uh, so we have to avoid excessive rotation of the head to any one side. In a ventricular, uh, in a VP shunt, uh, head needs to be turned uh, to one side. So avoid excessive rotation of the head. Uh, keep the eyes adequately lubricated and protected. Secure the endotracheal tube in the non-dependent corner of the mouth. So to prevent the drooling of secretions and uh, loosening of the adhesive tapes because of that. We should also keep in mind that a, a large head due to hydrocephalus will be a difficult mask ventilation as well as an intubation. And always keep uh, or you know always keep the pay, uh, keep yourself in a position to visualize the child under the surgical drapes because here we are talking about really small infants or in, in fact even premature infants. So uh, it should not be that the uh, that these children or infants are totally out of our uh, you know vision. So we should be able to visualize them. 
Next, move on to the prone position, uh, wherein uh, the myelomeningocele surgery is done in the prone position. So we have to keep uh, good-sized bolsters under the chest and the pelvis and keep the abdomen totally free. Because uh, if the abdomen is not free, an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure will hamper the ventilation of the patient. It will increase our airway pressures. It also compresses on the inferior vena cava and increases epidural venous pressure, which will increase the chances of bleeding. And also we have to keep in mind that adequate padding of uh, all the pressure points is done and avoid congestion of the face and the tongue by proper positioning of the patient. We must remember that extreme flexion during surgery uh, of the neck could lead to an endobronchial intubation because of short trachea and intraoral kinking of the tube. Hence, armored endotracheal tubes are preferred in certain institutes. And also keep in mind that excessive flexion or extension of the neck in an Arnold Shiali malformation may cause brainstem compression and uh, dependence on the ventilator in the post-operative period. The precautions that we are using at the time of intubation should all be kept in mind even at the time of extubation. So this is the position uh, which, is, uh, which may be uh, needed to be given at the time of intubation for a very uh, large lumbosacral uh, meningomyelocele. The meningomyelocele, the, the protrusion has to be also kept in a donut to prevent any damage and uh, you know rupture of the meningomyelocele. And um, uh, the head uh, should also be kept uh, in these adequately sized donuts so that proper alignment of the axis at the time of mask ventilation is possible. This is the typical position for prone ventilation. You can see that the bolsters are kept at the chest and the pelvis to allow unimpeded ventilation. Intravenous access in these patients uh, may be extremely difficult because they, if they are preterm infants and uh, neonates, uh, so that could be a challenge. And hence, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, we may require a central venous access, especially in a large meningomyelocele, uh, which may be associated with significant uh, fluid and blood loss. We then move on to extubation. Uh, the criteria for extubation are that the patient should be awake and breathing well with an intact cough and gag reflex, a forced vital capacity of more than 10 ml per kg, and maintaining adequate uh, O2 saturation on spontaneous ventilation. Uh, so, uh, uh, some considerations about the VP shunt uh, surgery. Uh, th these patients may come for repeated surgery or revision surgery because the shunt gets misplaced because of normal growth of the child or it can get mal, uh, it, it may go have malposition, it may get blocked or it may get infected. So these patients sometimes come for repeated surgery. And uh, the other procedure is uh, the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, wherein ringer lactate is commonly used to irrigate the third ventricle at the time of the ventriculostomy, wherein bradyarrhythmias may occur. So you have to be watchful for them. And initial cannulation of the ventricle at the time of a VP shunt may also be uh, associated with an abrupt bradycardia and hypertension, which can be treated promptly with atropin. Rapid intraventricular drainage of CSF during a VP shunt surgery should be avoided because that may lead to arrhythmias and a hemodynamic collapse. A careful observation of the patient in the post-operative period should also be done. If the patients have an altered mental status, then they could be at an increased risk of aspiration uh, because of peritoneal handling. So we have to carefully see these patients in the post-operative period. As far as monitoring is concerned, standard monitoring uh, like ECG, pulse oximetry, capnography, temperature monitoring is to be done. So uh, mild hypothermia as in uh, 34 to 35 degrees Celsius is supposed to be beneficial. As far as fluid management is concerned, glucose containing and hypertonic solutions are definitely not to be used because hyperglycemia worsens reperfusion injury. So uh, glucose containing solution is recommended 
only in neonates and well as well as premature infants so uh, the glu uh, the the glucose containing solution that we prepare is um, we had 25% uh, dextrose uh, 20 ml to uh, uh, 4 480 ml of rl so that becomes a 1% dextrose solution which is recommended uh, you know only in these neonates and prematures because over um, like older children are able to maintain uh, euglycemia because of the stress of surgery and no additional glucose containing solutions needed to be given to them <laughs> but of course we should keep in mind that hypoglycemia should be prevented at all costs so glucose monitoring especially in premature infants is of utmost importance we must keep in mind that hypertonic infusions increase cerebral edema and the most commonly used iv fluids uh, are crystalloids uh, which are rl and 0.9% sodium chloride i could not find much of literature on the usage of balanced salt solutions in the pediatric population so uh, i have mentioned mostly about normal saline and ringolactate only but normal saline uh, is the most uh, preferred uh, and widely used um, uh, uh, solution uh, because it is slightly hyperosmolar so it decreases the cerebral edema but we must keep in mind that large quantities can lead to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and hypernatremia ringolactate is slightly osmolar so large quantities may lead to cerebral edema and of course we must keep in mind that blood loss is to be replaced promptly with prbc of utmost importance is that hypothermia is to be prevented because uh, these patients have uh, especially for vp shunt surgeries uh, the entire uh, body is exposed so they are at very high risk of uh, hypothermia so to prevent that uh, we can use forced air warming give warm iv fluids as well as irrigating fluids and adequate cotton padding over the extremities as well as the head uh, to prevent loss of uh, heat uh, through exposure adjust the ot temperature accordingly and always give humidified gases so to summarize uh, for the anesthetic management of uh, hydrocephalus and meningomyelocele what we need is skilled pediatric airway management an appropriate good intravenous access correct intraoperative fluid as well as uh, electrolyte imbalance uh, before as well as during surgery and of utmost importance is to maintain the core temperature Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor Gorita, for your enlightening talk, uh, Doctor Ori sir. I think there is some problem with the connectivity issues. It was a very enlightening talk. The uh, topic is now open for discussion. And may I see in the chat box? As far as now it is concerned, there are no questions for you in the chat box. Just a few things that I wanted to ask you regarding the. Management of the patient, especially in hydrocephalus, with repeated surgeries, is there any specific thing that we have to look for in the same patient when we are doing repeated surgeries of ventricular peritoneal shunts in one patient? Then, what any any specific thing that we have to look for in subsequent cases, like regarding his weight part, regarding his urological status? regarding his antibiotics anything that we have to take part so most I, i think most of the times the the cases that i have seen which come for repeated surgeries because of infection that is the the you know the peritoneal uh, part of the shunt gets infected so it is uh, like it is from the antibiotics point of view that the surgeons they send a culture and you know then they change the antibiotics accordingly but uh, i i have not seen any association with weight or you know altered mental status or anything it's mostly uh, malposition of the shunt that also occurs commonly and the other thing is infection and sometimes of course with growth of the child if you know it is done at uh, a very young age then as as the child grows older the shunt gets malposition so then we have to do a repeat surgery uh just one more small question is there in the chat box the first one is what is your practical experience with injectable ketamine for uh, is it for neurosurgical procedures sorry i am not able to hear you ma'am for hydrocephalus procedures 
No, no. Uh, I, I am not using uh, intra intravenous ketamine in any of the neurosurgical procedures. My agent of choice is uh, either uh, pentothal or propofol. What about vedicobilocele? No, even in meningomyelocele, uh, I don't. I mean, I, uh, ketamine usage is not recommended. Ketamine is, anyways, not the recommended drug of choice for any, uh, 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 you know, neurosurgical procedure. Oh. Doctor Mayank, if my if I may interrupt, sorry, uh, I was wondering why should you uh, choose to use ketamine? when you uh, can use other drugs which are safe exactly give, exactly give them slowly there was a question in the chat box regarding the well, use of ketamine yes so that, that's, that's exactly i want to address that uh, there is actually no need to use uh, fall back on ketamine the other uh, drugs are uh, pretty safe if given slowly if you are concerned that there'll be a sudden hypotension bradycardia just give slowly now i wanted to add a few points one for the etv that's the endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy uh, one you should have a good iv access second uh, you may consider an arterial line though it's a very short procedure there are sudden changes in the pressures and the arrhythmias which you cannot probably detect uh, without an arterial line so uh, Uh, we, when you do a VP shunt, everything is smooth and slow, but in ETV it can be uh, catastrophic also. So you should be careful with ETVs. Mm, regarding uh, the position of VP shunt, uh, Dr. Shivastav, you showed a very nice picture where uh, wherein it's important till you get your axis aligned. Sometimes uh, the intubation part can be tricky. and see scolene is always plus minus whenever you are trying to intubate a baby with a huge head like this with an increased icp you are not sure whether you should use scolene electively or not though scolene is not going to suddenly raise the pressure because you are using um, propofol as well but still i am not sure whether i'll choose scolene as my first choice so i'd rather make a good position good intubating position a good backup somebody who uh, understands this one of the colleagues should be standing with you you should have a backup plan in mind plan b should be ready only after a good mask ventilation you should give your relaxant and you know we know how the difficult airway is dealt with so you should have a good plan b third the vp shunts often come with blocked shunts or even intersternal obstruction you know the shunt which is the peritoneal part of the shunt it uh, i've had children coming with obstruction and obviously the shunt is not shunting so the icp has also gone up so there is intersternal obstruction with the raised icp so even the gastric empty time with raised icp is delayed so you have a relatively full stomach or maybe a proper full stomach with intestinal obstruction and raised icp with a big head and a difficult airway so we've had these kind of kids so again your teamwork helps do everything step by step there is no need to panic plan and do it as a team in a step by step safe manner these are simple procedures we keep getting these kind of procedures every now and then but the whole idea in this setup is to keep uh, these kids safe not just intra op even post op post op monitoring uh, especially in the immediate post op is very important so i thought uh, this uh, i would add uh, to dr shrivastav who spoke very well on the topic but i couldn't keep myself to add uh, a few points thank you so much ma'am it is always an open topic for discussion thank you so much for the valuable input hello thank you uh, hello sir hello ha my my question regarding ketamine was very specific it was you know a pediatric patients with hydrocephalus they are suffering from separation anxiety and definitely all the all over the literature it mentions that ketamine is not to be used not to be used not to be used but all the time whenever we talk 
privately with people and uh, you know how they deal with the separation anxiety of uh, a pediatric patient who has been sep recently separated from the mother you have still have to put in an iv line and uh, you know the patient is really struggling and because of that struggle he is already in that struggle is anyway increasing his icp so okay literature always mentions that ketamine is not to be used but most of the time what we find is that people have been using ketamine this was the reason that i specifically asked this question what is the practical experience of the people uh, uh, in uh, the session that uh, regarding the use of ketamine as i told you that all the time literature mentions that it is not to be used but most of the times people are using it to manage the separation anxiety to you know secure the iv line before the uh, patient is uh, induced so that was the specific question it was specifically regarding hydrocephalus with a difficult airway in a pediatric patient so what is the practical experience of the people using uh, are they using ketamine or they are totally avoiding it uh, i think that as a pre medication you can still consider using ketamine if you are talking about uh, separation anxiety then you are talking obviously about sedation doses uh what i understood was that you were asking whether it can be used for induction so that's why i said that i have no uh, i mean I, there is no reason why we should be using ketamine as the induction agent but uh, yeah i mean if you are talking about separation anxiety then uh, maybe but i would still think uh, that uh, i mean uh, i would not be very comfortable uh, using ketamine myself i don't know about the experience of other people uh, i would request a special input of dr sadha sadwat sarkar madam she is a experienced pediatric uh, anesthesiologist so uh, she can give her input madam you are not audible madam you are not audible yeah am i now audible am i audible now yes ma'am ma am i audible yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am okay mostly these patients uh, with large hydrocephalus and all they are not that responsive basically they don't have much uh, separation anxiety or anything so mostly we are not been giving any pre medication to these children and we are directly taking them to the ot table that is what we are been doing mining meningomyelocele yes we can sometimes you we can give ketamine to these children because mm -hmm. after some time they don't mostly have the raised icp post operatively if at all the surgeon creates adhesions and everything then only there are chances of getting hydrocephalus or raised icp otherwise safely we can use ketamine in these children right sir i, I have so much for the further input uh, sir uh, so please may i speak yeah, yeah sure please. sure please ma'am as madam said uh, we uh, i mean when there is hydrocephalus pre existing the children are usually obtunded and uh, usually they have an iv line in place because pre for pre operative optimization with fluids and electrolytes these children usually have a, a iv line in place right. and uh, for uh, like uh, for subtle hydrocephalus which do not have clinical manifestations and mostly meningomyelocele which are done as elective procedures like we generally get the parents into the i mean one of the parents into the ot with the child and do an inhalational induction and uh, then secure an iv line and give the iv anesthetic agent we generally do not use ketamine so, so the, the final consolatory about yes sir so the, so the final consolatory about is that don't use ketamine yes. Yes, This mm -hmm. personal experience, basically, we can use midazolam along with. Any other special inputs on the topic? If I may add, ketamine. Yes, ma'am. Ketamine is not totally contraindicated. Yeah. Yes. But why do you really need to use it? Uh, no, uh, ma'am. As I said, uh, the inhalation inhalational agents are being used. So inhalational agents. they then themselves will cause high icp and specifically no, no. if we are using inhalational agents uh, in a person who is already struggling anyway there is a high icp that was the, i am not in uh, favor or against anything definitely it's not something which is like very clearly which can be really established but the thing is that what the people are doing that's what i wanted to know that uh, vitamin inhalational both will cause high icp so what next inhalation induction will help especially if you don't have an iv line yeah 
Yeah, so that is true. That, for that, then you don't have any other option but uh, other than using. Yeah, we have to use that. Yeah, you have to. And uh, the other thing is that an inhalational, I mean, uh, inhalational agents with a MAC less than one are non not documented. There is no literature to indicate that uh, they increase the cerebral blood flow and uh, uh, intracranial pressure. So definitely, of course, for induction, we will have to use higher MACs. But uh, throughout the procedure, we can definitely use volatile anesthetic agents, especially sevoflurane can be safely used at max less than one. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mayank, I would like to uh, say a few things on ketamine. Please, Badu. Please, Badu. Actually, I was just trying to recollect when I uh, read and uh, what I read exactly about the ketamine regarding uh, in uh, cases of neuro uh, trauma or neurosurgery or as far as neuroprotection, neuroprotective role is concerned. So what I recollect is probably now its role is emerging as uh, yeah. in neuro cases as well for neuroprotection, including neurotrauma and status epilepticus as well. So I think there is a, uh, much more to say about ketamine. We need to further uh, explore its role. I have to again read the literature, see, because I am not able to recollect when I read and what exactly I read. But this is what it is. So we cannot just say a single liner this movement that it is, it should not be used. We cannot say that. And yeah. practically, many of us have mentioned that for many neurodiagnostic procedures in children, basically, ketamine is the drug which is being used. So yes. this is what I want to say. And uh, maybe we can have uh, further discussion on the ketamine in any other uh, platform when uh, one is read a little bit. And I would just like to share an experience since you have talked about, uh, you know, diagnosis. I'm not able to hear it. Roberta, can you uh, stop, stop sharing your screen, please? Uh, please mute yourself. Dr. Lina has to mute herself. Dr. Lina, please mute yourself. Dr. Lina, please unmute yourself. Mute, mute, mute. Please mute yourself, sir. Bad look. Dr. Lina, please mute yourself. Yes, go ahead, please. Dr. Gorita, you can go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, since ma'am mentioned about, uh, you know, diagnostic procedures, uh, so in the pediatric patients, uh, when I'm routinely getting uh, CTs and MRIs done, uh, so intravenous ketamine is my drug of choice. I use it, uh, especially, I mean, I use only uh, ketamine, even if the patients are having, uh, you know, that raised, uh, I mean, if they're coming for the procedure, it, it is because they have a headache, vomiting, whatever, but uh, because, you know, of its ability to maintain spontaneous uh, respiration, I I think, I mean, ketamine is my drug of choice. So it is definitely in that scenario, it is not contraindicated for me because I feel as compared to propofol where I have that chance of, you know, in a, uh, in, in a remote setup of, you know, losing my airway, I think I would definitely prefer. And in fact, I'm using only ketamine for all my uh, diagnostic neurosurgical procedures. As well as uh, when we are doing these chronic uh, subdurals, uh, when they, they are doing a burr hole and we have to do the patients under, uh, you know, without uh, that spontaneous ventilation. Even in those cases, I routinely use uh, ketamine as my uh, drug of choice because of its ability to maintain spontaneous ventilation as well as its analgesia capacity. So that significantly reduces the dosing of all the other agents. Any other valuable input from the audience? Sir, with your permission, uh, can we now uh, start with the proceedings? Balotra, sir, with you your should, permission. You sir? should start with the finishing the, the and, proceedings now. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. That's what I want to say. Yes, uh, sir. Please, anyway, uh, please, please, please. Uh, uh, from from please RSVP Secretary, uh, I place on record the presence of... Uh, and Dr. Savita Sani, Senior Professor and Head, Department of Anesthesiology, PJMS Rohtak. Thank you, Madam, for joining today, especially on a festival day. 
And thank you so much, madam. And also, I wish thank very... you and happy Lodi to all of you. Thank you, thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much, each and every person who has joined this webinar on an auspicious day of Lodi. And secondly, uh, we wish Dr. Indrani Himmat Kumar a very happy birthday. Yeah. Happy That's birthday, madam. To say. Happy birthday <laughs> from my side. Happy birthday. Madam. Happy birthday. Uh, madam happy is, uh, birthday, Dr. Indrani. Happy uh, birthday, Indrani, madam. Uh, she was just here and she is logged in also. And I also uh, thank, uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Anil Ori, yes. though there was some technical issue. Ah, yes, happy madam. Birthday, madam. Happy birthday, madam. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you very thank much. Man. Thanks for all your love. Thank you very much. Have a great Lori and have a great new year. Yeah, thank same you, year. Thank, thank, you so much, you. thank you so much and same to all. And uh, I thank Dr. Raki for her valuable comments. Presence of Dr. Rakesh Garg, Dr. Ima Meena Madam, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, uh, Vishal Singla, and uh, other governing council members, Dr. Palta, Dr. Sunil Sethi, Dr. Rekha Das, and uh, other uh, members who have joined in here today. And we will, from our secretary site, we'll meet, uh, meet after two weeks. Thank you, Dr. Subayod, for joining, and Dr. Vitas Gupta, uh, good friends. And also, uh, it's a pleasure to have you all on board uh, in one way or the other. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mian, uh, for concluding remarks. Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Call, if you want to uh, say a few sir, words. That's what I wanted, sir. I wanted uh, to request Dr. Call, sir, to please have a few words. And the vertical can also say a few words apart from thank you. It's an excellent day, Dr. Mayank. It is an, it is an excellent day today. The Thank first you, sir. webinar, the first webinar of RSACP. Thank you, sir. Dr. Dr. Indrani's happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And then excellent topic selected by Dr. Man. Worked very hard. The speakers, the chairpersons, all deserve praises, including, of course, Dr. Naveen, Dr. JP Sharma, other GC members. All the best. God bless you all. Long live RSACP. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, sir. Excellent, excellent uh, selection of topics. Very well, uh, you know, very well done by all the speakers. They have covered almost all aspects of it. And even the, uh, even the discussion was amazing. I mean, that was a lovely discussion. So congratulations, and let's have many more in the coming year, Dr. N Dr. Malhotra. So we have they have kick-started 2021 webinar series of RSAC. <laughs> and and I, and I feel I had kick-started the 2020 series. <laughs> yes. So 2021 has kick-started so well. So well begun is half done. I think uh, next next time we will have a topic on resurgence of ketamine. Because it yes, increased yes. so, so, so much a good discussion. Yeah, so, right, right, right. <laughs> so, so resurgence of ketamine Ketamine. will be a right. topic. I in think the... that's a good idea. We can have a debate <laughs> on ketamine, right? Actually, we can <laughs> have a debate on ketamine. Yes, right? one hour debate, pro and con. Pro and con. And, and... Raki, Raki, you should know, you should understand, some of us are lovers of ketamine. So yeah, am I. Exactly. Yeah. So am I, man. And sir, so I have I. finished 2020. I mean, in fact, most of us yeah. are the lovers of ketamine. It's beautiful Just uh, we don't want to mention it. No, 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 no. That's not the point. It's a beautiful drug to be used judiciously in the right manner, in the right place. Then it's nice. I, I strongly feel about it. No, Thank you so much, sir. Place. Dr. Varsha has mentioned that is it recorded? Yes, it's uh, on YouTube uh, channel of RSCP. You can view it anytime. RSCP right. National Thank YouTube Thank you so channel. much, Balotra, sir. Thank you so much, Balotra, sir, for making me Viridra Sehwag of uh, uh, RSCP Webita Series 2021. Uh, opening batsman. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Shukar hai, you are modest enough. You have not made a tandilgar, bro. You are not a tandilgar, bro. You are not a tandilgar, bro. Anyhow, uh, with this, uh, I know it's a festival day. And uh, we thank uh, everybody for joining us today. And uh, wish you all a very safe and happy new year. And may all of you and your family remain happy and healthy. 
and yeah. we look forward to a normal life as soon as possible. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you very you much. Sir. Long live thank RSACP. Thank you so much, sir. Long live RSACP, sir. Long live RSACP. Long live RSACP. Long live RSACP. Yes, you are the host, so you have to uh, stop the, close the meeting. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Uh, Ed.